You can't even have a nation without tribes. You can't have tribes without clans. You can't have clans without families. Right? That's how um, that works. So we look at Numbers 1. It says that Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of congregation. On the first day of the second month of the second year, after they came on the land of Mizraim, saying, Take the psalm. That, that word is psalm, but that word is really rosh, resh. Take the chiefs, right? The chiefs of each house. Of all the congregation of Yashua after their families, by their houses of their fathers. So we talked about this last time that some of these houses were, were just newly being established. Because some people's families were left in Mizraim and died. Um... Uh, some of them didn't die and just never left Miss Rain. You know, it's a story from a certain tribe in um, in West Africa. They claim that um, they stayed, and then after the fall of Egypt, they migrated. Um, the person that I used to talk to a lot back then, she used to have a lot of history. She dealt with a lot of different African tribes. But she talked about the specific tribe, and that's their oral tradition. So saying that, let's say this. So these families were being established were not just bloodline families, but even new like families that was established at, um, to reform the nation after the catastrophe, right? <clears throat> I told y'all before that Yahuwah has all these catastrophes. Cata like there's so um, every so many years there's a catastrophe and there's a reset of the earth that Yahuwah does in nations. <clears throat> The first one we see, the first one we see, we don't even know what happened. And that's Genesis 1, 1 down, when it talks about Yahuwah reforming the earth. Is he didn't create the earth because the earth was already there. He already had created it way before Genesis 1, uh, we read them, 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 but 1, verse 3 and 4 down. We start, he talks about um, uh, bringing forth the land and the sea. The sea is already there. He didn't create it. It was already there. Right? The land was already there under the sea. Right? So the earth was already there, but there was something that took place on the earth that made it without form and void. In other words, a tohu and bo, which means chaos and confusion. So the earth was out chaos and confusion, and Yahuwah came and brought order to it. So there was some massive extinction level event that happened on the earth during that time. He would come, he creates man. Right? He creates Adam and Hawak. But go down the lineage, then he comes Noach. What happens? Man becomes wicked. The whole earth is wicked. So what Yahuwah does, he brings a uh, apocalyptic, world-ending, catastrophic event. Recess it again from one family. So that family goes on. Then he chooses a family out of that family. So now it stopped being um, world-ending events, and it started being events of that world or that family. Because that family became a world within itself. It says, Yashorel is what? World unto itself, a world without end. So now, these, this family goes to a nation. This nation goes into different, into different places, and then they have these, um, these apocalyptic, world-changing events. The, one of the first ones we see is the, play, is, is the famine that we see during Abraham time. Abraham had to go down to where? Mizraim, right? Um, next thing you know, um, after that, we see there's a what? World War. All the kings are called the slaughter of kings. That was, a, that was, the, that was the first world war on record, right? Uh, major um, battle. Next thing you know, a uh, little bit a little bit later, we see Sodom and Gomorrah, which was an apocalyptic what world in an event for their world at that time in that area. Um, you go even to, um, you can go back to my like the time of Peleg. Allegedly, there was this massive earthquake that separated the tectonic plates of the earth. Stuff is wild. I'm telling y'all, there's always these catastrophic world in it. Events that happen, and then it's a reset. So you're going down, then all of a sudden you, we, um, you got, we go down to Miss Ryan, we're there for a while, and then what happens? You who comes to what? An apocalyptic world, and then events to where? Miss Ryan. Seven, um, uh, ten, uh, ten different plagues, um, chaos, and destruction, and death, and um, all this other stuff happens down there. Matter of fact, we, before that, you know, it's Joseph and, his, and that famine. All these events, then they still know you got, um, you got, uh, the wars that start to take place again. You see, you got um, the Northern Kingdom going into Assyria. You got Yehuda going into Babylon. <clears throat> and these war, war, wars. Um, and then these now all these events are affecting just one people. 
it's like these the series of events that happen to that group of people. Um, and those events most of the time are captivities. So we got multiple captivities. I mean, you got captivities going right back through the Book of Judges. But we got all these captivities. The captivities wrapped up with what? Another apocalyptic event. Well, really two. First was the first fall of Jerusalem, where we talk, you know, it was horrific, right? A world ender for us. Next thing you know, we, um, we, we, we in Babylon for a certain little time. We come back, um, we chilling. Then Yahushua comes. After that, you got the Shalakim to go out and spread this world. What happens? Another apocalyptic world ending event for the people. Right? And follow Jerusalem. So horrific. Right? <clears throat> so you pass that time, just give you the whole the whole thing. So we leave from that time um, in 70 AD. And then we, we're um, in parts of Africa. We is we in Spain. We in all these other places scattered. Then here comes what? The Inquisition. Another world ending event for us. And it ended the world. That was the end of Israel. Inquisition was it. That's when the beast won, it was over, TKO. Then we was all in mass graves from that point on. Everybody scattered all over the world, don't have no idea who they are. None. No, no, no connection, no revelation about none of this stuff. And then the people even on the continent, some of them knew that stuff and still didn't even like hold to it or even speak about it. Some places, that it, you know, it was almost like taboo. So Israel was dead completely. And all of a sudden, here comes the awakening. You want to know why? Because there's about to be another apocalyptic world in an event. Um, so anyway, I'm just giving you that little history about how, this does, how these things work. And so when he, these events happen, and all of a sudden, the people have to be numbered. That's why when you start looking at the body, when, you, when Shaul talks about the, the assemblies, he start calling them families. He start calling the assembly a family. He start calling the, the, the men in the assembly his sons. The leaders, Timothy calling him father, ah, all this other stuff because he realized that this is the this is the manifestation of the tribes before the return of the nation, which was the assemblies. We've been been in the time of the assemblies for a long time. Well, actually, they time got cut off and then it re it like rebirthed, and now it's transitioning back from assemblies back to a nation, right? So, so what I have to say, that's so now they're numbering the people. Why? Because after this event that took place, now we gotta we gotta um we gotta add structure to this nation. Because what is a nation? Tribes. What are tribes? Clans and families. So now these families and these tribes gotta operate in order. Just like how when you um, whatever that event that took place in the arrests before Adam, you had to come and do what? Restore what? The order. So now everything had to be in this place. Everything had to be, um, things had to be named. Things had to be restored. Everything had to be set up. Boundaries. All this other stuff because now the, um, the reset. You know, it's funny because the heathen call it, say they know it's coming. They call it the Great Reset. This is a dude named, like I told y'all, Cla Charles, not Charles Schwab, Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab is the one that's over it. They're the ones that have that, um, those uh, humongous events that's over in like Switzerland, like they they call it the G7 summits, and then they'll have like um, Davos and all this other stuff, and they had these they make up plans for the for everybody else on the earth, whether or not they're gonna live or not. I'm just being real. Klaus Schwab's book, you know what it's called? COVID-19 and the Great Reset. That's it. look it up. You all got phones? Go Google it. Carl Schwab, one of the most wealthy men on the face of the earth. He's one to deal with the IMF and all this sort of stuff. They, they call it the Great Reset. They know a reset is coming. They're trying to beat Yahuwah to the punch. Then the new reset, man, I don't, if they succeed, if they succeed, it is the end of the world. And I ain't talking about our world, I'm talking about the earth. I'm telling you right now, if they succeed, it is over. It is over. Everybody on this earth are going to be mindless slaves to them people. This is the reason why war is breaking out now. Hot war. Because who is doing he's he's intervening on their plan. I gotta say this before we get started on this. So this is I told y'all this before. 
when we talked about Maxine. Then I told you Maxine ended up being friends with, with Magic Johnson. Okay. So it's this institute called the Max Planck Institute. You get a chance, you can go look them up. The Max Planck Institute. So the Max Planck Institute is what they do all these studies about what's going to be the next, the next phase. So the next phase is the self-spreading Maxine. That's the next phase. Airborne Maxine. So there's two ways they plan on trying to do it. And this ain't this ain't no conspiracy theory. This is fact. Like they they talking about it right now. One they're saying is going that Maxine is gonna go from person to person. Just like just like the flu would. Right? The other thing they plan on trying to do is have Maxine in insects. Not mosquitoes. I'm talking about like worms, cat, uh, caterpillars, things that eat crops. And they plan on putting it in all the crop. Max Planck Institute, go, go look. Got video, listen, they're not hiding this stuff. Videos on YouTube, they talk about it. So the next step is they're gonna, they plan on unleashing this whole horde of insects that, that that's friends with Maxine. They eat the plants and then, then the plants know Maxine. So now the whole, the whole entire food supply in the world is Maxine. So now there's nowhere you can go and arrest. Nowhere. Nowhere. You go to the island, Ma Maxine's gonna be there. You go to, to the continent, Maxine's gonna be there. You go up and wherever they got food, Maxine's gonna be there. Right? What's the whole purpose? To shape them in their image. That's the whole purpose. But the Max Planck Institute, you know, they just plainly say it on their videos. On like, They got explainer videos of how they plan on trying to do it. You know, a lot of stuff I will play, but, you know, they, you know, they chopping channels down. So I have to, you know, play this when we're not on live. Right? But I'm just letting y'all know, this is why Yahuwah said that if he did intervene, no flesh will survive. Nobody. This is like comic book movie stuff. This is super villain, Lex Luthor, the Joker, in-game, Thanos, Snap type stuff that's, that's going on in the world right now. And everybody's sitting around watching TV and playing, um, playing games and on Facebook and, um, and, and Instagram, Snapchat. But these people are planning the in-game. In-game. Would they do that? Everybody's going to be submitted to them as, as though they are a lure. Every nation. Yeah. When you just said comic book, um, in the show The Flash, that's what um, the villain DeVoe did. DeVoe, he, um, he was taking over the minds of all the people by, through satellites. And um, I, f I think he called it like the um, the last phase was the enchantment. And uh, when he pressed go on it, it was going to make everybody in the whole world docile to the point where they couldn't make decisions for themselves. Um, that was his end goal. So he, he would be the only person that had a, a mind of his own. And he was called the thinker. Basically, so, he knew everything. So one of the things they say in the economic forum is that you – you will own nothing and be happy. In other words, they will own everything and you will come to them for everything. Food, clothes, clothing, um, your, your social, they have a social credit score, everything will go through them. They'll decide what you will be in society. So this is, this is the deal. You gotta say something? The Max, what is it called? The Max Planck Maxine? Institute. Where is that? Is it here in the U.S.? Say what now? Is it here? The Max Planck Institute. Yeah. I don't know if it's in the U.S. or not. It might. It's in Germany. It's in Germany? Okay. But they working with the U.S. I mean, I'm just asking. I, yeah, I Max Planck Institute, um, a lot of the, the stuff that the United States need, thinks tank. Basically, they had any number of the think tank. 
Okay. Right, they'll put something like a hypothesis to them. They'll start digging, trying to figure out how to how to make it happen. So, um, but a lot of things that go on here, um, the data the data comes from the Max Planck Institute. Okay. I was just trying to figure out who innovators. Would, yeah, you're right. Who would be the like rulers if that were to take place? Say again. If they were successful with that, who would be the rulers of the world at that point? The um the people that that's part of the great economic the Great Reset or the World Economic Forum, basically. That's what they call themselves. Um, Klaus Schwab is one of them. It'll be, um, it'll be basically the bankers and um, all the corporations. That's really what's good. It's already that way in America. People just don't realize it. But pe right now, people still have autonomy. But whenever they do what they do, it's not. It's going to be no more autonomy. It's going to be them controlling everybody. So Mori Husha was talking about, um, unless those days be shortened, no flesh shall survive. The interesting thing about that that word when it says shorten, um, the the root of that word, um, the root of the word that that word comes from means to punish. So it's like it's like Yahuwah is saying, unless in those days, except in those days, unless I punish in those days, no flesh will be so well, no flesh will survive. So he's literally saying, I have to intervene and punish those who are trying to destroy you, or none of you would survive. So this, I'm telling you the seriousness of this. So every time when you were a kid, you heard the story of Noah. Right? Everybody heard the story as a kid. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, what would they tell you about after he said, no more, but what? Fire. So Yahuwah sent water to, so everything on the earth was corrupted. Like genetically, everything on the earth was corrupted during the time of Noah, right? So Noah was one of the few families that wasn't defiled, like his bloodline, right? So that's you know, and he was also faithful, so you would have chose him. But every almost everything in the earth was corrupt. Food was corrupt. This reason why even after that, things started being corrupt. This reason why you see when Yahusha, the son of Nun, in the Book of Numbers, when they start going um, moving from place to place. After they sent the spies out, they went to this place called the Valley of Eshkol. And they went to the Valley of Eshkol. The vegetation was, was, was different. They had these places where they had one cluster of grapes. It took two men to carry it. Yeah. Right? And that's the place where the sons of Anak were. The sons of Anak were the, um, were the you know, genetically modified humans. Right? So... And that's what the scripture calls. So any anytime you see the giants with six fingers and six toes, all that kind of stuff, that's where they came from. They came from a different DNA line. I don't get into all that right now. But so scientists know side note, scientists know that too. There's they have done scientific studies and they talk about how those um they track humanity from what they call mitochondrial Eve. Um mitochondrial Eve is the, the oldest known alleged person in the world. It's a black woman from Central Africa. The, I'm talking about white scientists saying this stuff. So from there, they say that they track the genetic, the genetic evolution of man. And then they say um, around so many thousand BC, all of a sudden there's a new DNA strand that comes out of nowhere. And nobody knows where it came from. Like they'll, they'll, um, um, Scientists, they call it um, alien. They say they call it alien. That's what they say. But there's a new DNA strand that pops up around um, so many. I forget so many thousand BC, 100 BC, and then it's like um, they have no idea where that DNA strand come from. So when you study the scripts, I, mean, I, I said this before. That's the last thing I'm saying on this because that is not my lesson. It's not our lesson. It's not what we talking about today. But you look and you see the lineage is post flood. After you see that, you, all of a sudden you know um, Noah had what. Him. If, if it, you got these sons that come out of that. One of them is Canaan. Right? So you look at the text, you saw it give the lineages, and then they talk about Canaan. And so Canaan um, and his families live in the, what we call the land of Canaan. Right? That's our heritage. That's what we're going back to eventually. So that's where all majority of the giants that we know about in the scripts were from. It's giants all over the earth. But the ones that we keep running into was in that territory. Exactly. That's like that's what Morio was talking about. That's what um Bali Eshkal was. So so sad to say. So when you go look up 
the the descendants or how these giants came to be, you will see these lineages that don't go back to Canaan. They don't like they just pop up. You're like, man, who, where um, where did the Zuzims come from? Where did the Emims come from? These, these people have these these people in the scriptures. You can't find no lineage for them. Say it again. And the whole rights too. They just pop up out of nowhere. Right? And so then from their lineages, you start seeing the giants. So when, when scientists study it, they say the same thing. There's so many years post mitochondrial Eve, and all of a sudden you see this, you see these this new DNA that pops up in the earth that came out of nowhere. So anyway, that's not the gist of how it pertains to us. What how it pertains to us is um, how I keep telling y'all how close we are to the, the to the really the true great reset. It's the reset of Yasharel, but it's going all the way back to Noah, right? Because in Noah, with time of Noah, it was water, and this time it's going to be fire. It's going to be nuclear holocaust. I'm telling y'all, it's going to be nuclear holocaust. This is what all the prophets saw. That's why they talk about um, vapors in the last days. It says it's going to be in the day of Adonai Yahusha. There'll be um, vapor, fire, and pillars of smoke, right? That's a, um, that's a mushroom cloud, a pillar of smoke. Then it goes on and says that the elements will, will, will burn away with uh, fervent heat, and it talks about how the sky will be on fire. It goes on to talk about how the land will be no good. It says wherever this place, whatever these things happen, it says it will be uninhabitable. You know what that's called? That's called radiation poisoning. Some drops. Nothing goes there no more. You can't, no crop. That's really, have you ever read about Chernobyl? That's what happened Tro, uh, in Chernobyl. They, allegedly, they said that there was families that was um, born disfigured for like generations for just being in that place. So the scripture talks about when Babylon falls, it says there will be strange creatures there. It talks about the satyr and the screech owl. So the, you know what a satyr is? That's, that's a half man, half goat. And it says that it will be the, 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 the cage for every unclean and hateful ruach. So it says that when this thing happens, <clears throat> that's why it says it's not water but fire this the, um, next time. Because the fire comes to the great reset. Then it's going to be, listen, one family again, numbered by houses. Yeah. This is how you hear it works in these cycles. Remember I told you I said it's almost like, it's like you're back to the future. We're going to the future, but we're really going to the past, right? Everything going back to the ancient. Why? Because everything that was ancient was um, declared from the very beginning. The end from the beginning. The end from the beginning. So, so saying is to say, and I'm trying to get you to the context of how important it is um, for Yahuwah to take out and pick a family and number them after this um, catechism. The, uh, cataclysm. Uh, catechism is the Catholics. Cataclysm that takes place. Catacombs, all that stuff. All the cats. So, y'all yeah, y'all get what I'm saying? So, Yahuwah's doing the same thing now. He's providing this now. He's setting this up now for this family that, this family that warns the rest of the world who didn't hear, just like Noach. Yahuwah says that, Yahushua says that, so shall it be in those days like in the, it's here. Just like how all of humanity basically was corrupted, that's what's about to happen right now. And it's going to be involuntarily. Go ahead. I just want to, um, and that's the reason why the point was brought out in regards to unless the days be short and in the context of what he's saying there about um, unless I come and punish them, none of you will survive. So you hear about Maxine all over the place, in your food, in the air, you know, all this stuff, wars and all this other stuff. And it, it gives a person who doesn't have an expectancy in Yahusha um, this almost like anxiety and fear. Like, what am I going to do? But scripture says, Yahuwah says that he's going to punish those so that you may live, right? So your focus should be about being engrafted into that family that more Yahushua is talking about that's going to go out of this place, that the earth and the order is going to be reestablished by because Yahuwah is going to punish them, right? You just make sure you're not yoked to their family so you won't receive the punishment. Hallelujah. I'm gonna tell you how how close this is to a repeat of what was about to happen as what happened then. All right. So the scripture talks about how 
there's this war that's going to take place, and it's going to be annihilation. Then after that, we'll go into a place, we cover for a specific time. The member says that the dragon comes after the woman like a flood. She's here for, for so many years. Then after that, she comes out, right? That's the nation gets to uh, be established. Then you have this war called the War of Gog Magog. You know who Gog Magog is? Yeah, it's, I'm just being real, it's all the white people. Um, I'm just people saying, gonna like you saying that you they are, but that's the truth. They're Gog Magog. <laughs> so, you know, listen, so scripture says that, I'm going to tell you how serious this is. It's, he says that they, they go to the four corners of the earth, gathering Gog Magog. So, what people are in the four corners of the earth? Us and the people that brung us. That's it. So if you know what Gog Magog is, Gog Magog is the territory of Caucasus, right? Um, that's the descendants of Yefet, right? So they was up in, um, in the Caucasus for I don't know how long. Then um, they ended up coming down, so um, from the Caucasus. After that, they ended up taking over lands and assuming identities. That's the reason why now they call us Negroes, because they assumed not one, of them, one group of people from the Caucasus assumed the identity. But they just assumed their identity. They assumed the identity of the Irish, the Brits, the um, the Moors, everybody, right? So sad to say, so those are the people, the people that bring us into captivity, they all descend from one group that came down from the Caucasus. You you have other, um, so you got that group, and then you have another group of, of well, I say the, when I say whites, I'm talking about what we consider to be whites in our, in our vernacular, like whites versus blacks in like territories of, of colonization. Because you do have another type of white that was, that's not that group of people. You got this the, the Turkish people that was like that came down. What I mean by that is like the people that that um were part of the Ottoman Empire. So the people that was a part of the Ottoman Empire are not those peoples. Because the Ottoman Empire was conquered by the people who came down from the Caucasus. Everybody got me? And I'm trying to give you a short history lesson on this. There's this whole empire that he talks about called the Ottoman Empire. Right? It was just as big and powerful as the Roman Empire. Right? So the Ottomans came, took over the Ottomans, or who, what people call now the Turks. They're the people that they call Iranians. They're the people that they call um, Iraqis. They're the people that they call Palestinians. All the people are Ottomans, right? They're the Ottoman Turks, right? All that territory, Jerusalem was conquered by who? The Ottoman Turks, right? And there was a war between the Ottomans and um, and basically the, uh, the, the British. Before then, there was another war. It was a war of, of the Moors. Man, I'm being there all day talking about this stuff. Anyway, the gist of it is this. So Gog Magog is the one who basically set up this current system. But they got one, one nation that's the, that's the head of all of them. They call it, Yahuwah calls it the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. That's Russia. 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 Matter of fact, before Russia was a nation, they called the Rus Kievs. Yeah. Right? So uh, Kiev Kievian or something like that, Rus Kievian or something like that. But it means the um the head of the land. They're like the they're the ones that there's like they're like the royal family of all the rest of them. Yeah. And they know who everybody is. Right. Russia right? knows exactly who each and every one of those families are. That's why they call Rus, because if you go look at the old spelling, they also call it Russia. Or Russia, because it's the Resh, the chief. Right? So saying say, Yahuwah says he'll rise them up. This is not the Gog Magog War. No. Let everybody know, this is not the Gog Magog War. This is not it. This is the fall of Babylon. Right? Yahuwah's bringing the king of the north against them. He's bringing um, uh, Asia, he's bringing the, uh, the Iranians, everybody against uh, Babylon. That's what's going on right now. This is the reason why the king of the north is raising up right now, right? But the gist of it is, why am I telling you this? Because just like how Noah, Yahuwah came and destroyed the earth because of the seed that was corrupted. You know what happened? They came back again. Yeah. Scripture says that there was giants in those days and after that. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, so many years later, they just popped back up. Right? One of, one of them go back to Nimrod. Just like scripture says that Nimrod became, if you go look at that word, it said became a mighty hunter, that word go back to defilement. 
something weird happened to Nimrod. And then if you ever see the depiction of Nimrod, he's like some kind of weird giant. Some people say that's the same person as Gilgamesh in the Babylonian um, story arcs, right? Gilgamesh is also a legend giant too. So all of a sudden, the giants come back. That's the reason why we end up fighting them. Because who would kill all of them in the flood? But they come back some kind of way. And you know who they come after? Us. So the scripture talks about how we'll come out and then we'll be in the land. It says, Ezekiel says that all of a sudden, God Magog says, I'm going to go to the land of without gates, no walls. You will deceive them. It says to a people that's come from the four corners of the earth. All of a sudden, God's like, man, nah, like, we got to go take these people. Just like it was in the past after Yahuwah um, cleansed the world with water. They came back and they became the enemies of the people. So it's prophesied to do the same thing. That Israel will come out and then he'll he going to scorch the earth with fire. And then these people will come back and then go to war with them again. Right? Only problem is when that comes, Yahuwah says that fear will come up in his face and he'll destroy them in an instant. And he says they'll be burying bodies for seven months. So... There are many people who are saying that this is the Gog Magog war, but that's not true because in order to understand the Gog and Magog war, you have to understand who Israel is. In order to understand the timeline, you have to understand and recognize who Israel is. Because like Moria Husha just said, when he says, I'm going to go up against them, or I'm going to go up um, to the, the city without walls, it talks about when Israel is resettled in their land. So when Israel, true Israel, is resettled in their land, then Yahuwah deceives Gog and Magog to come up and go against them. So where is Israel right now? Captivity. Still in the four corners of the earth. So Israel hasn't returned. So this is not the Gog and Magog war. This is what more Yahushua just made clear is the fall of Babylon. So who do Yahuwah brings against Babylon? He brings uh, the, the Medes. The king of the north, the scripture also says that the king of the south shall, shall push with him. Right. So the king of the north and the king of the south, also the Medes, the kings of the east, all of them come up against Babylon. All of them. Most people don't even know who the king of the south is, but we know who the king of the north is. Right. But it says they push together against Babylon. That's what scripture says. So who's the king? He's the chief. Resh. Russia. Russia. That's the king of the north. Right? That's, if you go look at the European nations, that's the biggest country. That's the most powerful country. That's the, the country where all the um, resources is Resh. That's the north. That's the king of the north. So, again, so going back to where we're at now, and the same thing it was at the time of Noah. So, I don't know if y'all, this is the reason why I hate TV. TV's garbage. Right? Because they don't tell you no real news. Right? So, one of the things that's going on with, with, I'm just going to say um, uh, the chief is that when it, in this current war that they're talking about, it just came out. It's even in mainstream sources, but they're not really pushing it. That allegedly one of the things that the chief is doing is going to bio labs in that country and blowing them up. Because he knows what's coming. So I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, in the soul soapbox of where we at. What I'm trying to get you to see is that this is where you who was saying that if he, didn't, if he didn't fight against them, if he didn't shorten the days, if he didn't intervene, what was going to happen? Right? So now you who is going to intervene, and the casualty is going to be, it's going to be mind blowing. So, so if you look, if you look contextually, you have a king of the north, and we're acknowledging that the king of the north is Russia. So, what would be the opposite of Russia? It would be a country or a continent that's southern to it. So, you have many nations that's to the south of Russia. You have China, India, Pakistan. Then, if you go even further, a little uh, southeast or southwest. You'll have countries like Sudan, uh, Libya, right? These countries that it talks about in, the, in, the, in this time will rise up against her as well. So it's this whole confederate of nations that Yahuwah rouses up in order to go against Babylon. So I'm not going to say a specific nation, which nation is the, the, the 
or who is the king of the head of the nations of the south. But there are many nations who are going to be confederate with the king of the north um, who converged from the south to go against Babylon as well. And we're going to see it with our own eyes. Uh -huh. Yeah, they all have a thread in common that has to do with a belief system. So, Ma, can I talk about that for a second? Okay, so Moriahusha hit on a good point. He talked about the Ottoman Empire. So most people don't understand what the Ottoman Empire was. So it was also called, um, it was also called uh, the Islamic Caliphate, right? right? So you're seeing the Russian Union being raised up in this day, but what most people don't see is who are their biggest allies. You have the Medes or Iran. You also have Syria. You also have these nations to the south of Russia, which are heavily Islamic. So the thing about the Islamic faith is, is that they'll beef with one another for supremacy, but when it comes to going against uh, uh, people who are foreign to their belief system, they all come together. So the thing they all have in common is, is that they're all of the Islamic belief. Right. So think about this. You got Russia. Most people don't even know 40% of Russia's army is Islamic. A lot of, of China is Islamic. We know about um, India is Hindu, but there's a heavy Islamic portion there. Pakistan, um, Sudan, Egypt, uh, Libya, all these places, Iran. Uh, Turkey, right? So you have these two nations who was these two um, uh, factions who were under one belief system who were world powers for hundreds of years, right? So you put them two together and what you'll have is um, one of the greatest armies that the world has ever seen. Imagine Iran, Syria, Sudan, Libya, China, Russia, Pakistan, all of these nations Possibly Turkey. Possibly Turkey, right? All of these nations. Then you, the, the other sleeper is, is most people don't know, right under your nose is Europe has become heavily Islamic. Europe is more Islamic believing people in Europe than there are Christian believing people in Europe. France, London, Britain. One of the things that they're doing is they're complaining about how heavily Islamic Europe has become, right? together with the, a combined hatred for one place. It's not only combined, it's an ordained hatred. For one place, what you do is you have a combustible sis, uh, uh, situation for the destruction of Babylon. Um, and Mori Husha said one more thing about them blowing up military installations. I mean, they're blowing up labs. So the president of Ukraine was saying that the Russians are blowing up military installations, but they're not. Those are bio labs, because Russia also knew that um, this government and that government, the Ukrainian government, were creating these bio weapons in those installations on their border. So this this war, there's a lot of underlying things that's going on in this war that many don't understand. So I wanted to say that as well. So, um, and it, it go back to scripture. I will still go back to scripture. So, you got two different nations who are afraid of two different nations based on scripture. Your pe the people that claim today, y'all, you know who their number one fear is? Nah, not us. They, they feel like they're running against us. They got to, they are not take over with us. We out here just out here. It ain't even Russia. You know who, who they fear the most? Iran. You wonder why they fear Iran? Because the scripture says that you who has stirred up the rock of the Medes. That's why. There ain't no other reason. So this country fears another country. Russia. That's the whole reason they're forming NATO. NATO. NATO is literally an American alliance that they created to try to like force them basically like to push Russia back. Like, to push Russia back and keep them in check. So you gotta realize that they've been both beefing with Russia since the 40s, right? So those are the two prophetic nations, the main nations that Yahuwah speaks about that comes in as a confederate. You know what they just did, what Russia just did um, yesterday? They signed a document to have Islamic soldiers as um, part of their war outside of their country. Right. 
So what more you just saying is that it was said that Putin is bringing in over 20,000 Syrian soldiers to come into Ukraine and fight that war. So his biggest allies are Iran and Syria. He's bringing in those Islamic soldiers to fight in Ukraine. That's the alliance. Right. And so then one of the last things that you got to look for is the destruction of Damascus. Can the scripture prophesize that too? So they've been bombing it for the last two months. Isaiah so, 17. Isaiah said, listen, this is how close we are to the end. And while I'm talking about at the end, we're talking about the end of these, this current age. But why I'm um, pressing this, or why I'm giving this whole history prophecy lesson, is I'm trying to get y'all to know and understand why and how important these things are we doing right now. This stuff is, is a whole next level type of weighty. It's going to be like, this is the future of the world right now. Like, what I mean by that is, we're moving from a place and there's going to be certain ones are going to be, um, the certain ones that are literally going to be, have, the world is going to be in their hands after this transition. And this transition ain't going to take long. Because the powers that be are about to destroy each other. Right? You know what happened with Abraham? All the powers that be, all the major nations went to war with each other. And destroyed each other. And then he destroyed them and came out with what? That was the first World War. We're in World War Three now. It already started. Right? So, seeing it to say, so when these things happen, we have to have order. Who goes here start establishing the order so when his nation is formed, everything will be Kodesh. Everything will be in line. So going back to these houses, that's why he says take the sum, take the, the number of the chiefs According to the congregation of children of Yahshua, after their families by the house of their fathers, with a number of their names, every man by the King James says, Poles, that word is skull. It means their head, literal head. People they're counting heads. They go by these chiefs and say, okay, this house is, is reckoned by this man. This house is reckoned by this man. This house is reckoned by this man. And then they start putting structure into the nation. So when they move forward, just like with, uh, with, with Malu, we talking about uh, Mori Malu saying a minute ago, so let's say when they get ready to move forward, they're not going to tell the whole nation to come together. They're going to go get who? They're going to go get the heads. The heads are going to go back, bring them to the houses. They're going to give instructions to the families, and then they're going to move forward. So if you read in Numbers, um, and you're going, back to like the, going up to like the ninth and 10th chapter, you start to see that um, they have Pesach. After that, they start having the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, he talks about the moving of the camps. Why? Because the heads are established now. The chiefs. So now the chiefs can go and they can number the, they can um, co basically corral the families or get the families in order. So when the nation got to move forward, when the trumpet blows, when the last trumpet blows, then they do that. Move forward. Right? Y'all true. So, so anyway, so I want to say this, and this is where um, it gets hairy. This might not sit, sit well with somebody. <laughs> But it's just the truth. And this is this is how we have to move. And this is how sensitive the time is. So what does that mean? What does that mean when I come into the assembly and and I'm like, man, so now um, the nation has to be numbered by chiefs um, and houses organized. So that means, let's say if we have a visitor next week. A visitor coming to the assembly. We should not have no visitors next week. I'm just saying. So don't think y'all coming because there ain't no visitors next week. Right? So... <laughs> Let's say we got a visitor. <laughs> and the visitor walk off the street and he said, Man, I just want to be part of Rebirth. He said, Okay. So they come here and they sit down and I'm like, Man, what family I'm going to be a part of? That's not how this works. It's not, it's not how this works. Right? So this is the, this is the thing. Right? When you're talking about these families and being reckoned in number, right? These it's not um, what's it, arbitrary. Everybody get what I'm saying? It's not like you come in and then somebody say, "Oh, we got another person. We're gonna stick them with this family, and now they're part of that family." And the reason why we're gonna do this is because listen, whatever families that are established from that point, that's a that's a literal bloodline. Right? In two generations. Just two generations. That's a literal bloodline. All that that house is, even though they might have might not have been for that before then, all related, now they're literally re related. 
right? So we can't bring just anybody and then bring that into your bloodline. You can't come into a house and be like, okay, I want to be like, you know, like it's Walmart. You come over there like, man, I want to be in the chief's house. Yeah. Right? So now my children are going to be with the chief. Right? It's not going to work that way. This is how it's going to work. When you come into these tribes, right, you are a visitor until somebody identifies you with that house from the council. Right? I mean, I say visitor. What I'm saying is you part of you ain't part of the tribe. But I'm going to give you an example. I guess the visitor is the wrong term. So in the scripture, it talks about how they had, they had strangers. You know what the strangers did? They lived with the tribe. People think that the strangers that live, the strangers live in the in the tribe. They had a specific landmass territory that was specific for them. That's where the strangers live, and they live amongst the camp of the nation. So now, a stranger is not a heathen. So I want to get that out your head. People think stranger, they think negative. So a god is not a goy. You get what I'm saying? So the idea is that when a stranger comes in, that stranger, he's somebody who is turned from the gods that he had. He's com uh, committed to the to the cause. He's walking with Yahuwah, but he's not necessarily numbered with a nation. This nation is the people that he came with. He or she. Y'all get what I'm saying? But they're submitted in the tribe. They're going forth in Yahuwah, and they actually live with the people. So they dwell amongst the people. But there are certain um, strangers who actually became people of... Uh, and grafted into people's bloodlines. One of them is our grandmama. Great, 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 great grandmama. Right? Who are we talking about? Right? She was a what? She was a Moabitess. Right? We have another one. Right? So they came what? Into our, they came, they didn't just become a stranger. They could have just been a stranger in the nation the whole time. But they end up doing what? Being engrafted into what? A house. Caleb. Caleb's, um, yeah, his uh, father was an Edomite. Right here, look. I was on you better put it up? Yeah. It's, it's up. yeah. It's <laughs> Hallelujah. So, go, go ahead. I'm, I was going to say what it is. All yeah. right, so, when Moriusha was saying that, I was literally looking that up on my phone. So, Caleb was uh, the son of Yaphanah. He was a Kenizzite, right? So, his father was one of those individuals that Moriusha is talking about, Right? He was of the house of Edom, right? Kenizzite. But because he remained faithful, he was engrafted in. Now it reads, um, uh, let's, let's, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. Do you end up being a, like a, 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 really like a chief in the house of Yehuda? Hold on, I'm about to, I'm about to, I'm about to go there. So go it says, verse 11, not one of the men who came up out of Mitzrayim, not one of them, from 20 years old and above is to see the land which I swore to Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, because he did not follow me completely, except Caleb, the son of Yaphana, right, the Kenizzite, right, or the stranger, right, right? and Yahusha, son of Nun, for they have followed me completely. So you're telling me one who was of the lineage of a stranger is now reckoned with the house of or with the tribe of Yehuda, and he's able to enter into the land, and nobody else outside of him over the age of twenty. So this will get interesting. What was um, Kalel's mom? Was she Edomite? She was a Yehudi, right? Father of Edomite. Go ahead. So the first judge in Judges was Othaniel, the brother of Caleb. So that's where we see that how important it is to get grafted into these houses and how official it is because of the house. Now that lineage continued until Nabal, right. where Nabal was cut off. He was, um, he was from that same lineage. So... Of course, the lineage is based on your share imuna and obedience and devotion to the tribe. Like we was talking about last week, the um, 
A Torah is a measure of someone's devotion to a nation. So your devotion to that nation is going to come through a Torah. A Torah comes through a house. Right. Do not forsake the commands of your father, the Torah of your mother. So that means that to what you're, the, the point you was, you was just um, touching on, his, he had to be a grafted a part of a house and receive the ruach of that house, that set apart ruach that made him able to have a continuance in um, the land and then even to be able to duplicate, again, going back to adulting. Yeah. An adult is able to um, reproduce a non-traumatic seed. He was able to reproduce that seed in the land, even um, reproduce it amongst his brothers. Right. To where he could be a judge amongst the people. Right. You got this up? Yeah, just real quickly. What Memoriosa was saying in regards to um, it. So it says that Caleb and Yahusha had a different Ruach. Right. Exactly what it says. That's what it's saying. They have a different Ruach of obedience. That verse that we read um, in Numbers. Um, <sighs> I want to give y'all the verse for context. Numbers 32, um, 11 and 12, uh, which we read where it says, Not one except uh, Caleb, son of Yaphanah, the Kenizzite, and Yahusha, son of Nun, for they follow me wholeheartedly. So his name, Caleb, is Kaf Lab, or Kaf Lamet, but it also is Kaf, and then you have the Lab at the end. It means uh, wholeheartedly, right? So his heart was formed a certain type of way towards Yahuwah. That's why he was able to make it in. But also, it wasn't, it wasn't only formed that way towards Yahuwah. It was formed that way towards who he was submitted to, the house and family he was submitted to, to the point where he was able to make it in and Yahusha and nobody else of their, their class or their age group. So people read Caleb's name and they say dog. But when you look at the Hebrew, it just means wholehearted. He devoted his whole heart to Yahuwah, his whole being to the cause of Yahuwah. Whatever Yahuwah told him to do, he did it, even in submitting to the house in which he was engrafted to. Just like Grandma. Right. Grandma Ruth did the exact same thing. And Rehab. Right? So this is what we're looking at um, in the context of this. So. When somebody, if somebody, <clears throat> when you come, thank you, Yach. you come into the into the assembly or basically the tribe. You coming into the tribe, you have to be identified um, by the chief of a house, right? To be a part of that house, right? So if you're gonna be, the, and that's what we're talking about with Ruth, you know, uh, we, both, we know what Boaz did. Boaz brought her in, and then all of a sudden now she's in the what bloodline. Um, we talked about um, Caleb, um, you're, you're funny, his dad, and then his mom, and then him being, um, then not only that, him serving you with his whole heart. Same thing with Baruch. So these are people that were identified. Again, Ruth, I mean, Boaz identified Ruth as somebody that was um, um, fit to be in that house. Right? Say again? So... Boaz is uh, Rahab's son. So that was Rahab's testimony, was that she was able to submit to um, Caleb and, um, and uh, Yahushua and them. And then ultimately she came into a house, Shaloma, was, was the, um, from Yehuda, who she married. And then in that she had Boaz. Boaz, he's seen it. So now he's duplicating that functional, submitted, wholehearted seed that set apart Ruach that um, they had to have to enter into the land. It's duplicated in him. He's seen it in his mother and his father, so he knows what it looks like to take in a woman who has a heart towards Yahuwah, even though she may have been outside the bloodline initially. Right. Can I say something deep? I just thought about it. Yahusha did the same thing. Yahusha HaMashiach. He was the so oh, he is the son of Yahuwah. He is a Lua, but he was engrafted into whose house? He had to submit himself to that house though. Think about when he, he went away and he was gone for three days, right? And then his parents came 
They like them, and they realize he was gone. They're like, man, where he been at? And he comes, and then um, he says, I'm about my father's business. But he still went back home and he submitted himself to his parents. He became a carpenter, right? His earthly father was, he submitted himself to that house, right? Even though he was the ruler of all, right? So how much more us? And it's crazy because the scripture talks about how Yahushua is not, nothing that he experienced is, nothing that we experience is foreign to him. Right. To the point where even we can relate what we talk about now to his experience on the earth. Right. He came as a Lord and submitted himself to the house he was engrafted in. Joseph, the house of Joseph, even though he was the son of Yahuwah or Elua. So, um, this is where um, the rubber is going to meet the road with our interactions with each other, right? Because this is the thing we talk about about honor, right? And how honor is lost in our culture. Like, we don't really have honor. We just kind of move, you know? Um, because we, in our mind, what Christianity taught us, remember we did the whole thing about right down what's left in you about in Christianity, right? So what Christianity taught us is that um, we don't need another person to serve Yahuwah, right? That we have, and, and one of the things that we, we all talked about was um, personal relationship. I got a personal relationship with Yahuwah, with Jesus. You know, they said Jesus and God. Um, I got a personal relationship. You know, my personal relationship, my personal relationship. But this is the thing, though. How can you qualify whether or not you're serving Yahuwah without a person? You just serving what? Elder just said it. That's it. You want to say it on my go? That you can't you can't qualify because you, you're serving you, yourself. Uh, even Yahusha said, um, "The greatest among you shall serve you." Right. So even the context of even the the, the king, the king is a servant. He's the first among brethren. That's that's all it is. So you have to serve. So this is the thing, going back. So we believe this. We have this mindset when it goes to, um, but we hear some other people say, I don't, you know, I ain't, I ain't, ain't going to serve no man, right? Um, this person just a man. This person just a woman. They ain't nobody, blah, 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 blah. But the gist of it is that whatever measure you meet can be measured to you again. If you don't show honor, you will not receive any. That's it. First Timothy 5 says, Rebuke not an elder, but treat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as emus, the younger sisters with all purity, or the, uh, the akayot with all purity. So all, honor all widows, though, in need, widows indeed. But if a widow have any children or nephews, let them first show um, grace at home and requite it to their parents for what's good, that's good and acceptable with Yahuwah or Lord. So the idea is this, elders being fathers, mothers, um, elder mothers being emas, and it creates this whole, this dynamic. We talked about the family dynamic because we're no longer thinking about trying to be a pastor, trying to be an evangelist, trying to be a superintendent, whatever that is, or whatever, executive, whatever. You know, there's a thing, yeah. I, I still know what executive pastor is. What is that? Somebody tell me what it is. Is that what it is? Okay. I don't know. So we, we're, we're past that because we, we're transitioning to a tribe. So in a tribe, it's not, it's, it's not necessarily going to be about pastors. It ain't going to be about pastors and bishops and, um, and all that. It's going to be about chiefs, emas, right, um, uh, akodis. It's going to be um, sabas and sabtas. It's going to be all this. It's going to be a family numbered by, um, by houses. So we got to know how to deal with these houses, how we deal with our, uh, with our emus, how we deal with uh, our sabtas, how we deal with our sabas, how we deal with our abs, how we deal with um, our aki, how we deal with, um, with um, the akayote, like how we're going to move. Because if we don't know how to move and function in order, then there won't be no nation, right? And one of the ways we qualify, going back to about being in these houses, so let's say you come in the midst of a tribe, and you're like, man, I'm, about, I'm, I'm being a part of this tribe. Part of your vetting is how you can you submit 
in that tribe? Like, can you can you fully walk um, in the midst of that tribe um, and be seen and approved by the elders? So that's another trigger word because people feel like I ain't got to uh, approve anybody, right? All I got to do is prove who? Myself. So, man, I spelled the whole thing wrong. Hold on a second. Yeah, only God, only God can judge me, right? So, so, the scripture talks about showing double honor to those who, who, um, who is worthy of it. So it's not, it ain't about you just show, it's not about you just going and boosting somebody. It's not about you trying to hype them up or blow them up. The honor goes back to how you deal with them. How you deal with each person is, is your worship. That's your worship. How you deal with your brother, your sister, that's your worship. Whether or not you can show them respect, that's your worship. Whether or not you can um, co-labor, we talked about adulting, that's your worship, right? So you have, you have praise and worship. We come in here and we, we praise. Now praise is a type of worship. But your worship as an Israelite is your, is the, your collective life. Right? So going back to this idea of being approved by the elders. Right? Um, because this thing about it, who has set the elders up in his what? Government. So the elders, the whole purpose of an elder or Ema or uh, you know, Go ahead. So I got you. This is uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17. It says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads down the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So we look at Esau and Yaakov, right? What happened, um, what is the beef between them two people? He saw your coat. What's the beef? Give me some answers. Rubber, rubber, rubber. Rubber, rubber. Esau gave up his birthright, and so um, he's he's got like an eternal hatred. Towards your code. Towards your So Esau gave up his birthright and he got an eternal hatred towards towards Yahuwah and, and his brother, right? All right, so when did he when was he about to receive their birthright? When did he have the birthright? He was about to receive it at the blessing his father was going to give him. So he didn't already have it. He he actually he never he never was going to uh, get the blessing or because um, it was already prophesied to his mother that it was for uh, Jacob. It was for already for Jacob before he was born. So the people you know, they, they use the term supplanter and they say that that Jacob was evil. They act like he went and jacked him for his birthright, right? So we know that the, the instruction had already been given that it wasn't supposed to go to him in the first place, right? Now, so let's look at this. There was a moment in time. Now, these, so you got basically these two adults. People try to act like they was little children. They weren't little children. <laughs> right. Say it again. They was all, so, so Genesis, I think it's 26, where it, um, it talks about uh, the wells that Yitzhak goes through. Um, he goes through all these wells, and um, Yahuwah establishes these promises with him. He basically re relived a lot of things that Abraham went through. And at the very end, this is right before the whole blessing situation, it says, verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of the Berry, of, of Beri the Hittite for his wife and Basimeth the daughter of Elon the Hittite and they made and he and they made life bitter for Yitzhak and 
Rebecca, Rivka. And then 27 starts going into Isaac was old and then his eyes started to go dim. So that means it's probably 20 more years later. So he's like 60. So he's still. People also don't realize that Abraham was alive for part of those boys' lives. So both of them had the opportunity to sit at Abraham's feet and learn from him because he was the patriarch of the clan. So we take that into consideration too. So now y'all understand the context of why Esau said, if I don't get some lentils, I'm going to die. He was like 60 years old out there. Hunting <laughs> game. He was like, let me get that suit there, brother. I can hear anything, anything out here. So, so what happened? How did um, Yaakov end up getting a blessing? How did he end up getting it? Yeah, where his um, his mother told him to go in and to hunt and get the food back and to bring it to back to his father. And then, you know, they disguised him so that he could, um, of course, resemble Esau so that he can be first in line to get the blessing. Okay, so now here comes a greater question. Okay. So he did that, and then what happened? What did, um, what did Yisak do? He blessed him. And then what happened? And then after that, um, Esau came and tried to give the blessing, and then he realized that he already gave it to Yaakov. Scripture says he tried to search it out with tears, couldn't get it, right? Yeah. That's so true. let me ask you a question. Could Yaakov receive the blessing without Yisak give it to him? No. The house. So I want everybody to stop and pause. Wait. Meditate on what I just told you. All right, go ahead. So it says that Yaakov, or it says that uh, Yisak was terrified. Because he knew he couldn't undo it. Not only could Yaakov not get it by himself, nor Esau get it by himself, it says that this honor no man takes by himself. So, go ahead, Mom. That, that Esau went and got these foreign women, right? And it said that he made his mother and father's life bitter. Well, when you think about the blessing, the blessing was the, um, the continuance of the, the seed that's going to become a nation, right? And when you look at the nation, the priesthood, and the kingship come through Leah. But he, Esau should have gotten Leah, the mother would have sent Esau to her people to get his wife. He should have gotten Leah, but he didn't. He got these other women. But the kingship and the priesthood were going to come through Leah. So who ends up getting Leah? Jacob. Also, it's, it's, it's good to recognize, and this is what a lot of us have to recognize, and we got to do introspection on ourselves. So Esau didn't reverence the birthright. He didn't reverence his place in the house. That's why it was easy for him to give it up, even though he wasn't ever going to receive it. He didn't reverence his placement in the home. He didn't, his parents desire. His parents desire anything. No, he didn't no. reverence it. So this is where... The rubber meets the road, so I'm trying to get you to see the, the importance of how this order works. So the way we think traditionally is that it's me, I got a personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the way we traditionally think. I got a personal relationship. I don't need this, like this person that's, that's in between, I don't need this person. This person is here, they, they, you know, they help me, they might pray for me or whatever, but it's not important for me to have the blessing. Right. Listen. Everybody feel what I'm telling you right now. So, does not all blessings come from Yahuwah? Yeah. Right? Can no, man, no man can't take nothing of himself. Can't even, he can't even give himself life. Got to depend on Yahuwah for everything. 
But in this context now, we know that Yaakov ended up inheriting everything. That's, only, that's the only reason why we out here calling us um, Yashorel, because of him, right? But he could not receive it if his father didn't bless him. It wouldn't happen. To the point that they, we had this whole elaborate story of all these events that had to take place just so his father would bless him with his mouth and say, you know, I'm going to put this blessing upon you. If just, just think about what I'm saying, and then you will get what I'm saying about the importance of the mentality you got to have about honor and about the words and the weight of those that, are, um, that Yahuwah has before you. And that it could be um, your eternal blessing or your eternal curse and um, anger, bitterment. We've been a national teeth because uh, real fast. So this, so this is the kind, this is what I'm trying to tell you about why you can't just come inside of a tribe and be like, I right, now I'm just gonna do this and do that. I'm Ema now. I'm Elder now. I'm this person, I'm that person. The Ema or the elder has to bless you, speak a blessing over you for you to be able to move into that. It's not, is you dealing with you? Of course he's dealing with you. He brought you to them. Listen, listen y'all. He brought you to them. If he didn't bring you to them, he would just had you at your house. He definitely wouldn't have had you on the other side of the country and brought you here for you to not listen to them. So you got to understand, like, going back to, Yaakov could have been like, man, I don't need him to bless me. <laughs> you, you, you get what I'm saying? He could have easily been like that. Like, I don't, need, I don't need him to bless me. I know who you who he is. Even Esau said at 60, Basically, Dad, do you have a blessing for me too? Right. That's how important the blessing of a father is. He's all like, even if it's just a carnal one, give me something. He knew that the blessing came through the father. So, so the blessing came through who? The father. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as, the elder women as, the younger sisters as, what? So this is what I'm trying to get you to see about that's so you come in, people come into the assembly and be like, man, they don't they ain't allow me to do this. They ain't allow me to do that. They haven't given me the blessing. Right. So immediately you go into bitterness, you turn into Esau. Mm -hmm. Ooh. 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 I, I thought ahead. it was the lamb roll that was stirring you up. <laughs> so this morning. Elder Yoab sent out a, a message, um, the whole book of Obadiah. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks at that book, and they'd be like, oh, see, Esau going to get judged. Mm. It has this line in there. It says, when you see your brother being chastised, like, be careful how you deal with him because he's coming back. And the, the understanding is that it's us, right? It said he's coming back to, it talks about the exiles who go to Sepharad, all that stuff. When they come back, they're they going to be established with this birthright. So, and then it starts talking about Esau being judged. Esau is the one who hates his brother, period. Mm -hmm. Envy, jealousy, all this stuff that appears, in, you turn into Esau. The Yahudi who are not Yahudi. Right. All of a sudden you became Esau because you couldn't treat your brother with honor. You couldn't treat your sister with purity. You couldn't treat your elder as a father. All of a sudden you turn it because the thing is with Esau, Esau didn't care about that birthright until he realized, oh, I was supposed to be listening to this dude. Right. Because he was out here stressing his parents out. Yeah. Yahuwah was dealing with them, showing them all kinds of stuff. Yahuwah establishing covenants. Yahuwah got moving kings and stuff to come and make peace treaties with him out of nowhere. 
And he's like, man, I'm going to go see what these Hittites talk about. Like them Hittite women. Ain't that what brothers do, though? That's what brothers do. Your brothers, just real quick. All of us got brothers and sisters. And some of us might have been this individual. We don't want none until our brother or sister done got it. We didn't realize or reverence what it was when our parents had blessed them with it or gave it to them. Or we might have gave it up. Now nah, he can have it. Then when you see them playing with it or they got it, they benefiting from it, you like, you turn to Esau. <laughs> but you gave it up, though. So all of a sudden you see his worth. So that, that was the whole thing with Jacob and Esau. In uh, Esau's old age, he had kids. Jacob ain't have no kids right. in his old age. That's why it was so precious, the things that happened like when, when he came out of Laban's house with those sons. That, it was like a treasure. He wasn't trying to risk that for anything because he valued what he had inherited from his father. Right. He said, not only do I have these sons, but I have the promise. So even when the whole situation happened with Dina, and then um, Levi and Shimon went out against his direction and, and murdered these men, right? Right. We know that those men was getting murdered, period. Who was going to judge them? But he's at, when you look at Genesis, I think it's 49, when he's blessing them, he's addressing Levi and Shimon. All of a sudden, cursed be Levi and Shimon, for in your anger you kill men. When it's time to receive blessings and inheritance, they couldn't receive something that they should have been able to receive over Yehuda. Because they were an elder to Yehuda. Right. Reuben. Yeah. Man, he says, um, unstable as water. That's exactly what he said. You shall not receive preeminence, even though he was the firstborn. Reuben, disqualified because of how he dealt with his father. Shimon, Levi, disqualified because, because they dealt with their father. But Yehuda, what did he do? He said, I'm not about to leave Egypt and not um, have something to bring back to my father. When he came and they dealt with uh, Yosef, he said, I'm not about to, you're going to have to take me as collateral or something. I'm going to have to destroy this whole place. Whatever I got to do, because I'm not about to give up Benjamin. Because that will destroy my father. So why do you think all of a sudden... The scepter shall not depart from Yehuda. Right. Because he dealt with his father. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. Right. To the point where he knew how to deal with his father. Right. Even all the stuff he, he, he had to repent from. He knew how to talk to his dad though. Right. This is what Esau doesn't have in him. He doesn't have honor. Right. There's no honor in him for his elders, for his emas, for his brothers, for his sisters. Period. Because he feels like he has a direct connection. Exactly. He don't need all that. So speaking of fathers and sons, we know uh, Timothy called Shaul father. First Timothy 4.13, listen what it says. I'm oh, sorry, 12. First Timothy uh, 4.12. It says, let no man despise your youth, but be example for the believers in word and conversation and charity and ruach, imunah, and purity. First Timothy 4, now I'm on verse 13. It says, till I come, give attendance to reading and exhortation in, in Lekha. Neglect not the Ruach, only the gift that's in thee, which was given to thee by prophecy and the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So for a long time, I'm like, man, what the heck does presbytery mean? It means the council of elders. So what Shaul is saying that is that when Shaul met Timothy at some point in time, he blessed Timothy and laid hands on him and then there was a gift that was imparted to him that allowed him to do what he did because he was approved of his father. So it made me think of um, going back to the commandments that we've received. Honor thy father and thy mother as you who your Elohim have commanded thee that thy days, sorry, no, oh, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which Yahuwah your Elohim giveth thee. Now, of course, we're thinking about our natural parents, right? But 
think of it in the context of being in the tribe and you not being able to honor your father and your mother who's in the tribe. But you think you're going to go into the land. It says right here that in order for you to make it into the land, you have to honor your father and your mother, honor your elders, that it may go well with you. For many people, it's not going well with you because you have not learned how to honor your elders. But then somehow you think that you're going to make it into the land. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't compute. That's not the formula that Yahuwah gave us. The formula says, honor your father and your mother, and then these things will happen. Honor your elders, and these things will happen. It's going to go well with you, and then he's going to go ahead and put you in the land that he gives you. You don't even have to fight for that land. He's going to give it to you. If you rewind back and honor your elders... So to that point about honoring your fathers, so the thing that our ancestors in the wilderness weren't able to do was to honor their father. Not only Yahuwah, but also they weren't able to honor the fathers or the father of the assembly at that time, Musha or Moses. The two that made it in, guess what they were able to do? Man, Yahusha was, he was so dedicated to honoring who was his father at the time. It talks about how when Musha would go, he wouldn't move from the place. When he was up on the mountain, when he was in the tabernacle, and he found so much favor in Yahuwah from his honoring of his father at that time, when Musha would leave the tabernacle, Yahuwah would have him to stay there so that Yahuwah could minister to him in the tabernacle because of his obedience and submission to Musha. The reason being is because of the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So Yahuwah told Moshe to bring Yahusha before the people, and he said he laid his hand on his shoulder and then pardoned a gift on him and gave him a new name. People don't know his name wasn't Yahusha. Moshe called him that. His name was Husha. Moshe started calling him Yahusha because Moshe knew that he was special. And I'm just being real, like, when you talking about Yahusha, the son of Nun, people don't know, man, that man was the truth. Yahuwah, you talking about the only, one of the only leaders in the history of Israel that didn't make hardly no mistakes, or if not any. They dude went into Canaan and took the whole land like it was nothing. And every time it was a mistake, it wasn't because it was his fault, it was the, it was the people. Right. But, Maury, can anybody tell us Moshe's son's names, his biological sons? Anybody? So, it wasn't about the biological connection. Apparently. So going back to Timothy and Shaul. So in Acts 16, it talks about when they first met. So Timothy already had his own little ministry gone. Right. So it says uh, in verse 1, it says, Shaul came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Yahudi woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. He was very well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. So he, people knew about him. He was already out here doing his uh, street teaching and all that stuff. Shaul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because the Yahudi who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So we talked about this before. They established that you didn't have to get circumcised. Right. If you was born outside this covenant, you didn't have to. But he was showing that he was submitted to his spiritual father, right. to his elder. He, he put his ministry aside. He left everything he was supposed to be doing that, that he thought he was supposed to be doing. He completely submitted himself, submission, to put yourself under somebody's mission. Right. It says, as they went on their way through the cities, they del they uh, delivered to, to them for observances and decisions and had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the assemblies were strengthened in Imunah and they increased in numbers daily. So then you go in there where he's saying, don't forget, 
we lay hands on you. Right. Not in the, I mean, maybe they did lay hands on him. Said, I'm going to chastise you like a father does his son. Right. Sometimes a father got to lay hands. But, son, <laughs> but, but he's saying that you got anointed. We spoke these words. We laid our hands. We imparted it in you. Right. That stuff is real. When um when he did that, Timothy became the only one that stood behind, stood beside him. That was his son. Everybody else turned on him. Everybody, to the point where um Shaul was talking to him about it. He sent him a letter. He says um all the things that happened to him. He's like uh. For these which, this is for, uh, 2 Timothy 1, he's telling Timothy about what happened to him. For, for the which cause also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I, whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He says, hold fast to the sound words which you've heard of me. Then he goes on to like 14, uh, 14 and 15. He says, this thou knowest that all them which be in Asia have turned away from me. Who's in Asia? The Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Col Col <laughs> right, the people in Colossae, all the all the books. That's all Nicola. <laughs> Except one person. Think about that. You talking about all them countries that was in Asia Minor? One person. One person. Because you, well, he already had what laid his hands on them and imparted into them. He says. Um, this thou knowest that all them which be in Asia turn away from me, whom of uh, Fagilius and Hermogeles. He says, uh, Adonai gave me mercy in the house of Anosiphorus, for often he refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But I came, but when I was in Rome, he sought me very diligently and found me. He says, <laughs> listen what he says. Adonai grant me that he may find mercy in, it, in that day of Adonai. And how many things he ministered to me at Ephesus is I very know as well. So in another scripture, he started talking about how, how much evil they did him. But anyway, so I'm just, giving, I'm just giving this example of this whole process of being approved. Scripture says, show, study to show yourself. Approved by who? Your elders. Right? So why is that important? Because they have the ability to impart into you or to bless you. This whole walk is just about a father blessing a son. That's all this. is. why scripture says it's a man's covenant. Because Abraham decided to bless his son. And then his son decided to bless his son. Say it again. Abin. Abin. Remember we did the whole lesson about Abin and what it really means? That's the... The whole, the whole father and the son. That's why Elijah must come. Unless you who would do that? Smite the earth with a curse. To turn what? The hearts of the fathers to? And do what? Sons of the fathers. If we don't go back to the family unit, then he's going, he said he's going to smite the earth with a curse. Because he's already going to judge the earth with fire. Right? But if we don't restore this, then he's going to, everything's going to be lost. The whole world. But he already promised that he wouldn't do that. So this is where we are now. So first thing that we want to do is um, we want to get into the homework because we didn't even um, touch that yet. Who, who, who accomplished their homework? All right. Praise your hoosier. So who want to speak on that? And then we'll, we'll go back into this. Anybody want to speak on it briefly? Praise your hoosier. Everybody did it, but nobody want to talk about it. Oh. The homework. Um, you want me to read uh, read all my? Yeah, don't name them names a lot. We don't know the names. Just go, yeah, just just read it. You know, I come with a whole list out here. <laughs> okay, it says uh, write down what you think you have not released specifically from Babylon. I put um, I have not released rebellion in the form of procrastination. I have not released the comfortability mindset. Just being uh liking to just relax and being too laxed, you know, chilling, watching TV or whatever, just being relaxed. Uh, being comfortable and slugger or slack when I should be doing more. 
um, for the esteem of Yahuwah, and also technology and depending on it, being too dependent on a, a phone or something like that, the internet to show me something or, you know, uh, GPS, anything, just depending on technology. And the next part was, what are you afraid to let go? What or who are you afraid to let go of and why? Identify dysfunctional relationships. What do you think will happen if you let it go? Um, you don't decide, you don't decide it is. Yeah, you don't got to say no names. You can say it just like in general. Um, in general, <laughs> yeah, we skip that if it's very specific. Cause I don't want to want to offend nobody out here. I think that was the last part. And it, it goes it. to uh, um, identify any dysfunctional relationships. Um, what do you think will happen if you let it go? Uh, are they adding to or taking away from the walk I'm on? And I'll put that basically they're taking away from the walk that I'm on because it's not adding to. If it's, if it's not adding to, it's taking away it's in some way, even if you don't see it. So, Hallelujah. Anybody else? And then Mace after that. Um... One of them is uh, family members. Um, I did this with my wife, so she uh, helped me out. She said I, uh, I was opinionated. Uh, uh, selfish thinking, uh, and I'm still in, I put, I still in battle war for the territory of self-focus and self-worship. And uh, what are you afraid to let go of and why? I put my parents, Especially my dad, they always was there for me in my full-fledged wickedness. Uh, they lost a lot because of me, condos. They sold because of, you know, lawyers, bond money. Uh, gave their last dollar for me. Uh, I stole from them, insulted them, hurt them, and they never gave up on me. Even to this day, they, you know, ask us, you know, if we need anything. So... Also, I'm uh, afraid of letting go, of leaning on my own strength. I have my guard up. And then uh, identifying dysfunctional relationship. Uh, it's basically mother, uh, dad. Dad had, like, he had a stroke, so it's not really, like, ain't really anything dysfunctional about it because he's like a child. But uh, with my mom, it's dysfunctional. And then um, I don't talk to I put I don't talk to them daily, you know. And I said, and this is the thing I said, what do you think will happen if you let it go? I said, I think they will feel betrayed. This is what I think. I'm not saying that, that but I think they will feel betrayed. Everything they fought for and gave me in the end was for just to break them. I feel like they would die from sadness. It would bring a lot of pain to them. Um, and are you be able to believe what Yahuwah said about you in the word? I do. It's got to be truthful. Like Morimalo said earlier, I sometimes I tend to forget that means I haven't really internalized that thing that's been spoken over me. So, Aliyah, so I want to speak to that um, uh, about letting go. So, letting go is not necessarily, um, it's, it's not like, Isolate, especially talking about your parents. Now, if it's other people, it's hard cut off because you know you always got to balance um, re, um, showing respect to your parents, right? Um, respect doesn't mean um, um, following after the same path. Don't mean that. Don't equal that. But it's still a, a way that you move in respect. So um, you don't have to like if you if you separate yourself is more so you're not enmeshing yourself you understand what i'm saying um like giving space but in the same time being able to have if you have when you have to have conversations being very respectful um because at the end of the day you know some people you can't be some people are just hostile time 
Like, they're just going to argue and fuss and cuss. There ain't nothing you're going to do about it. They just pat that in them. Um, but the ones that you can actually talk to, if you can talk to them, just make sure you, sh you, you know, you just show them respect um, by having making small talk with them when they ask for it. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want your, um, your, your walk to be sullied in the fact that you don't respect them. Right? Go ahead. So <clears throat> when Maury's talking about being enmeshed, what he's talking about is, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with doing something for your, your biological parents, going and putting the trash out for them, doing, you know, doing things that they can't physically do anymore. There's nothing wrong with that. But enmeshed means there's a way that you operate with them that is not esteeming Yahuwah. It's not esteeming Yahusha. There's some pattern of behavior that you have with them that is taking your eyes off of Yahusha in the way you interact with them. What you described sounds like a loving parent, but it's actually an enabler. You got in trouble, you did whatever, you went here, you did this, you did that, and they kept rescuing you out of it. That seems like love, but it's actually a form of codependency that kept you in that bad behavior for longer than you would have been in it, likely, had you just been able to hit some lumps, right? So that doesn't, that's not to speak against them, that's just to say that what you're describing is not something Yahuwah would do. It's not a way that he would parent. It's not conducive to wholeness for you. So you can't be caught up in how that dynamic plays out because if you are, you won't develop into the person that Yahuwah wants you to be. You understand what I'm saying? So you can honor them by doing something for them, helping them, talking to them, checking in to make sure they're okay, but getting caught up in those old behaviors that cause you to be immature while they rescue you, that's not honoring to Yahuwah and it prevents you from growing. So that's just one example of how a family of origin can keep you stuck and not proving yourself to Yahuwah. Yeah, so another thing is you got to look at, I, was, I had, I'm trying to develop that definition in my mind. So another way that you can measure about whether or not you have a healthy relationship with your family I mean, by healthy, I'm like rockily healthy, like not being a mesh. Because there's a way to, health, to have a healthy, uh, unhealthy relationship in your hood is with, to be enmeshed. Um, but one of the ways you can measure it is, um, do I trust my leadership? I mean, my bad. Do I trust my family that's not in the walk more than my leadership? Yeah, I need to write that down. Ask yourself the question, do I trust my family that's not walking with Yahuwah more than my leadership in Yahuwah? If the answer is yes, you're dysfunctional. Go ahead. So <clears throat> the reason that's dysfunctional is because your family that's not in the walk and not submitted to Yahuwah and Yahusha doesn't have the same goal in mind as you do as one that's submitted to Yahusha. Their goal may be for you to get a job, be, uh, buy a house, have nice cars, nice things, get your college degree, whatever. These are things that the world tells us are good goals to have. But what has Yahuwah told you to do? What has he commissioned you to do for him? What has he told you about this system and its end? What has he told you is coming soon? So if you keep lining up with what your parents' wishes are for you, as opposed to what Yahuwah's desire is for you, that is dysfunction because it takes you out of function for Yahuwah and puts you into function for that natural parent. I just want to be clear. I don't submit myself to my mom 
no, yeah, no. Nobody's, nobody's saying that. Which you, you. No, we're not saying that at all. I, I want to speak to this point because I, I had this on my mind after we were discussing it the other day, and Ahmad just brought it in perfectly in regards to what's your goal. What is your goal? So the reason why we asking that is because the other day we was discussing this thing, and people, instead of doing what's expedient, they do what they prefer or their preference. So when we was talking about it, so a lot of people's preference is, like more Yahushua said, to trust in their family. Their family who is of the world, it's a preference. It's a thing that's been kind of wired in people for decades, right? But what's expedient towards your goal? What are you gonna do? Your preference or what's expedient towards your goal? But the question is you have to recognize what is your goal? And Amar, can you explain how you explained it the other day in regards to, um, so they can understand expedience in regards to getting to a goal? Yeah, expedience means what is going to be the most effective choice to make in terms of reaching a goal. You know, so for example, if my goal is to walk across that threshold, is it going to be expedient for me to remain sitting in this chair? No. But what if somebody I love very much tells me, you deserve a break. You should sit. You should rest because of everything you've been through. Don't do that. Just rest. Let's talk. Is that counsel expedient to my goal? No. So that's, that's the point. Is the counsel that you choose to submit yourself to, is it expedient towards your goal? So then you have to look at, like uh, Morimalo said, what is your goal? What is our goal? My goal is to get to the kingdom. My goal is to remain submitted to Yahusha and Yahuwah. Um, so any counsel that, that uh, causes me to do things that are not expedient to that goal have become a problem for me. So we're talking about families and houses. So who can tell me what's the goal of the houses that are in the body of Yahushua Mashiach? Uh, Zach, can you Mace, you want to answer that? Or you want to? Go ahead, go ahead. Give it a try. To be grafted into the overall family, like the head family, chief family. Okay, Agahu, what is the goal of the houses um, of the body of Yahushua Mashiach? Uh, to build a nation. To build a nation. All right, let's get Kumar, and then we're going to get Sam. Uh, Samantha, excuse me. Um, uh, I would say um, building functional relationships and uh, um, building as one and understanding order so that way as one house we can move in the bigger house. Okay, now let's get Samantha. It's okay. You, you were going, though. Um, I think for me, it's more of restructuring the way that you've seen those relationships. So, um, you know, for our culture, a lot of us haven't had, like, healthy relationships with their father or their mother. And so the point of the house is to see how it's supposed to be. And then for you to be able to receive the things that you lacked uh, in the past, to, to feel that, and so then you can be a functional individual because you now um, can no longer say that you lack that thing and that's why you're dysfunctional. Okay, so Ma, could you give us an uh, uh, understanding of what is the goal of those individual houses that add to, or those houses that the chiefs are over that adds to the body of Yusha Mashiach? What is the goal of those houses? Okay, um, before I say that, let me real quick make sure I clarify that none of the previous words that I spoke were specific to a person in here, right? I wanna make sure we understand that. I wasn't speaking to any specific person's relationship with their parents. I was giving examples and understanding 
not springboarding off of anything that Yuri said in terms of directing it to him, but simply sharing because what he said brought into view some things that we do in families. Yeah, scripture right? says that there's nothing that one goes through that's uncommon to another. So his testimony is all, Minnie's testimony in this room. Right. So that's how we have to I just want to make sure it. I clarified that. Okay, all right, so now having said that, the function of the houses, so we know that we're engrafted into Yahusha, and we know that Yahusha has called certain um, men to sit in the seat of Moshe, to sit in the seat of the Shelech, the Selakim, right? We know that when Moshe was alive, he led the nation and he established how they would walk. And then the Shalakim came, the apostles, and they carried on that tradition. Prior to them, it was the Pharisees, right? So now we come fast forward and we look at the ministry that we're currently in, Rebirth, and we believe that our leadership sits in that same seat, right? And so the houses being established under them is for the perfecting of the saints, so to speak, so that we can learn to perfectly submit, so that we can learn to perfectly work together in Ikad, so that we can learn to perfectly love one another, so that we can learn to perfectly be restored to function, because we've come out of dysfunction. Many of us have been in families where we don't know what a father looks like or does. We don't know what a mother looks like or does, or what they did was the best they knew how to do, but it was dysfunctional. So now, how do we immediately be transformed into these people that are able to be in the kingdom without being dysfunctional? I talk about all the time how some of us came out of the church with this magical idea that we were gonna poof, be transformed, right? And then we're gonna poof, be in the kingdom. But the scripture doesn't say that. It says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So being in the houses is a tool to help us work out our salvation. If we can't figure out how to function together as a family, we will not be able to function together as a nation. Hallelujah. So Amar just explained in that perfectly. The question we have to ask ourselves is what is or what are the most expedient actions for me to do as an individual to add towards that collective goal of the house? Not what I prefer, right? But what is the most expedient for me to do to add to the house's goal or vision, right? So we know one thing that's not expedient is bringing our old family trauma methods, ways, and characteristics to this new housing setup. That's not expedient, even though it would be preferred by many of us because it's familiar. What would be expedient would be, um, like I'm always talking about, submission. Um, um, listening to do, not listening to respond, right? Um, uh, can, can we name some more, you wanna name some more things? But just being honest about issues that you have connected to family of origin vulnerability yes being able to be seen and um trusting that you're going to be accepted and received your behavior might be corrected but you as a person trusting that you as a person is going to be loved right so a lot of it has to do with casting out fear because some of us learn defense mechanisms from our families of origin and so we don't really know how to be with each other because we're fearful of rejection from each other. A lot of us don't, how we, what we operate in pride. We don't know how to admit when we need help. We don't know how to, we'll go back doors because we were taught not to ask mom or dad for nothing. You know, so we'll, we'll go back doors and not communicate. Some of us have poor communication because we were shut down and not allowed to communicate with mom or dad. You know, it's, it, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Also, it's another thing that's 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 big um, that we do as a people when it comes to family is we tend to run. And that's what Yahuwah was showing me. We run from family responsibility. Um, and that's what the mom was just talking about, the vulnerability. We run from that. 
We run from intimacy. We run from the hard conversations that are the most productive for us. Um, we run from accountability. We run from somebody else's direction. And we have to stop running and be planted. Um, and I was sitting earlier and I was talking to, um, you know, my sons earlier. And Yahuwah had me to ask them, why are you running? And it was such a powerful thing. And he had me to ask it like 10 times in a row until they all start breaking down. And Yahuwah was putting it on me that, that we've all had this wandering type of Ruach on us. It's, it's like a Bedouin Ruach. We haven't had a place we can call home. So when we finally get something that's really home, that's firmly established, we can't really recognize it to the point where it's fearful for us to remain there. It's fearful for us to accept the father, accept the mother, accept their word, but it's easier for us to reject it and run because that's what we've been doing all of our lives since Yahuwah turned his face away from us. We've been these wandering sojourners, never having a place to call home. But the thing is, Yahuwah will restore families before we go out so that he can send you into a land already established in a household. Can I say this real quick? The fact that this is happening is proof that Yahuwah has turned his face back to us. Yeah. Right? Praise because Lord. didn't he say he would return he, the fathers to the, to the sons? He said that, right? So this is proof that our inheritance is activated. We're, we're walking in our inheritance again, right? So we can't deny our inheritance. We can't turn our face to our inheritance. Some of us don't, we have not known what it's like to have an identity, but an identity or an identity based on something that wasn't righteous, you know? So now here's an opportunity to have an identity. That's one of the blessings of the Father. I did a message many, many years ago where I spoke about the blessing of the Father. Until you get blessed by the Father, you ain't, you're not right. You can't, you're not going to be right. You can try. You can do all kinds of stuff to feel whole. But until you get the blessing, the approval, the uh, acceptance of a father, the, a righteous father, you don't, you're empty. You will feel empty. You will feel lost. And so what Yahuwah is giving you is an opportunity to have that in a physical form. We know we can say, oh, well, you know, Yahuwah is my father. I'm a father. And that's true. But if you like me, sometimes you need some flesh on it. Sometimes you need somebody that you can look in the eyes and they can tell you, I love you, I accept you, I approve of you, right? And so to be placed in a family, to be placed in a house is an opportunity for you to receive that, that sense of identity that maybe you just didn't get the first time around. That's a good point, Imayada, you wanna speak? I was just saying that the identity comes from the father. So when a child's born, you usually get your father's name. When a woman gets married, she takes on her husband's name. So you're given that identity. So when you receive from Yahuwah, you receive his name. But for a lot of people, um, because you didn't know your father, you didn't have that identity. You might have even had his name, but because he wasn't present, you had no identity. So it was like um, carrying around this uh, picture with a question mark because you didn't really know who you were because of that lack of relationship with your father. So now being in Yahuwah, in Yahusha, we've taken on his name. So now we have an identity. And because we have an identity, now we're supposed to carry our father's name, not in vain, but bring honor to his name, right? And going back to, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were speaking on honor, um, how we don't want to bring shame to, bring shame to our, 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 to our father's name or, you know, the honor, going back to honor killings and how important honor is, is the same thing with Yahuwah now that we have his name, not carrying his name in vain. Uh, if I'm saying I'm a child, you know, in church, like, I'm a child of God, you know. If you're a child of Yahuwah, 
I'm not going to bring shame to his name. I, if I carry that name, I need to bring honor and reverence to that name because his name should carry weight. That means whatever you do, there should be a certain level of weight and authority that you walk in because you have your father's name. I come in my father's name. So now you have a certain level of authority and power that you move in because you know who your father is. You know the, the weight, the kabod that he carries. And so you too should be carrying that same level of, of weightiness when you move around. So I know um, Mace wants to go and ask the question. I mean, answer the question that was asked earlier. Praise your um, But just so I don't miss out on this opportunity, um, I just want to say this to the point of Imam Malaka and um, Imam Yada about Yahuwah checked me early on even our responsibilities as fathers. Um, and it hit me because, um, and he said I can share the testimony. Um, you know, one of my sons came up to me earlier and they said, um, you know, I just wanted to come to you and express to you that a while back you told me, and this is before we started reestablishing the houses, he said, you told me that um, I'm not your father. And I told him that. I said, I'm not your father, but it was in the context of look to Yahusha, he's your father, right? But bringing it full circle, Yahuwah brought me to that moment earlier, and um, I had to ap apologize to him because Yahuwah had me to look into his eyes and to his, his vulnerability at that moment and see that um, the words that were spoke spoke to something that he was dealing with earlier and prior. Mm -hmm. So I had to apologize to him. And like Amar said, I had to say, I receive you, I accept you, and I love you. You are my son. And um, it was almost like this breath of life went back into him. And Yahuwah was showing me um, of the weight of even carrying the mantle of being a father in a house and how it can be for the building up or the tearing down, even if you don't, even if the way that you say a thing um, is not how you meant it in the context of now. So I just wanted to express that and give validity to the point that Imam Alaka made and Imam Yada, um, you know, made as well. This is just real quick, um, just a confirmation of that, of all of that, because I remember as, it was go as we were worshiping still, I was sitting there and I was crying and Imayata came up to me just to hug me. And then I, like it was pressed on me to just just continue just to cry in her arms because I was like, okay, my house is being called, but I don't know how to be a mother. I don't know how to be a wife fully. I'm still learning these things. How am I to do this? And I was thinking about what um, Maury Malu just said about not, built, not bringing those those ways, those methods, those old characteristics into this new this new family that you're building. So in my mind during being on stage, as everyone is like smiling, I'm literally crying because I'm like like I can't I can't go back. I can't corrupt something so pure and I need help because I don't know how and what to do and I'm talking to Imayada and Imayada is like speaking to me she's holding me and she's allowing me to just have this moment of vulnerability and my eyes are closed and I'm just crying out to her and as soon as I open my eyes to and tell her thank you like my house is standing next to me just waiting to hug me and literally all I could do was just break down and cry because I didn't I didn't fully receive it in that moment until then like wow I have I got to do this thing. And, and Yahuwah, like, I don't know how to do this thing because at an early age, everything was so corrupt and perverse or um, um, formed into a certain enmeshment and where you're just so intertwined with corruption and dysfunction. And it's just like now I have to unweave and allow Yahushua to unweave those things out of me, pluck those things out of me by st and still establish something pure at the same time as I'm still work as he's still working on me. And just to see that they received me in a moment and they had no idea what I was going through in that moment. I was just like, all I could do was say praise Yahuwah, praise Yahushua, because I was not prepared for any of this or that. So hallelujah. Hallelujah for the healing. 
Um, the first question was, right, what you think you have not released from Babylon? And truthfully, um, it was myself. Um, fear, shame, overthinking, my comfort in myself. <clears throat> um, I have released everything around me but myself. Residue of the old me still pops up. Fear of the unknown causes me to overthink. Um, what, who, and why? It was what, my thoughts. Um, who, myself, why? Lack of trust, afraid of how I would look, afraid of the unknown. <clears throat> then it was, yeah, I put, I am afraid to let go of the overthinking because I feel that I will mess up, make mistakes. I am afraid to let go of the possibility of falling. I know that I must, but I found myself going through a string of thoughts before making the decision, instead of just making the decision that I already know. I am afraid of knowing the unknown um, because I believe I should know the answer or I believe that I can get the answer and decide in which is not trusting the Adonai. Um, the next one was, what do you think will happen if you let go? Um, I think I will fall. I think I will be looked at or seen in a negative way. I think that I will be rejected. All of these are things I know is not true, but I know in my mind, but my body still reacts in a way of fear that will be rejected, which is a lie. But I began to overthink the truth. Then eventually I submit to the truth, but the process has become a normal thing instead of letting it just happen. <clears throat> Next was identifying dysfunctional relationships. And it was myself, again, I have a dysfunctional relationship within myself. I think about things within myself and I struggle with not what's right or wrong, but needing assurance, needing assurity in myself instead of just believing the word within me. I have a lack of faith within myself. Abba has confirmed all things within me, but I let fear um, make me to overthink the truth. Am I able to believe? Yes, I am. But because of um, the Torah that I have within myself, it, um, I'm not able to fully. Um, I am not able to believe because of myself, my own thoughts. It's a lie. I need, a, I need confirmation to validate my thoughts instead of just believing. Fear holds me from just believing. My thoughts, seem, my thoughts send me into overthinking. Even though I know the answer, I overthink it, point blank period. So um, what I, I think that's the last... I think that's the last one, but I had wrote, and um, I had wrote, I have a Torah within myself, you were revealing to me. Um, I trust in myself because I grew up having someone to trust in. That's why I give myself the opportunity to speak, and I willingly listen to it because I trust in myself. The overthinking is a relationship within myself, a trust in myself, and when I get in a situation to trust in Adonai and believe what he told me, I give ear to myself. And I began to overthink back and forth, back and forth. Then, then I seek for confirmation to resolve or get an answer. The enemy is myself. I am able to, I'm now able to believe, but I stop myself from believing because of the Torah within me that I have trusted in my whole life. So that's basically what Yahuwah was willing to me about it. So, so <clears throat> praise Yahushua, when, when I was hearing from you is that um, that you really, you really actually settled, but it's your mind that's not. Like your mind is like you. You're assured in that you're gonna serve your whore. You're not wavering on that. What's going on is that um, because of rejection, um, that rejection is what keeps you in a place where you feel like you're not being accepted. Um. So this was, um, so I think if you who have it, who has saw uh, or seen, I should say, um, more Moshe's Chief Moshe's teaching on the schizophrenia revelation. Okay, praise Yahushua. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It's like two parts. You need to go and watch that. It's four parts now. Okay, crazy. Four parts. So y'all need to watch. Um, the schizophrenia revelation. So um, one of the things he talk about is, and you know we don't say this before at times, but it's the same thing. So rejection is. So who who's seen the movie Ghostbusters? All right, the old school one, even the new one. They got a new one. It's the that's like, it's the renewing of the old one. It's literally like the same movie. So anyway, so 
in Ghostbusters, the first Ghostbusters and the last Ghostbusters is very demonic, actually. Um, but they had these two people. One of them is called the Gatekeeper, and the other one is called the Keymaster. So the Gatekeeper and the Keymaster um, have to do engage in perversion to unlock this realm where this ancient Ruach comes through, right? So that's rejection. So rejection is the gatekeeper and the key master, right? So rejection is really, he, he's almost like this Ruach that really doesn't do much. All he does is he opens up this gateway for all his homies, and they like deep. Because once he opened up the gateway, then this is um, envy, jealousy, hatred, murder, um, you name it. Every, almost all the Ruachs, they like, so going back to the example about the key master and the gatekeeper, they have to come and do perversion in order to open up this doorway that this other Ruach could come and set up shop, right? So the first thing, that's the reason why I say it's perversion, because how... What rejection does is it perverts your mind to allow your gateways to open and affect you in certain ways, right? Because it'll, per it'll pervert your view of something. Like you will hear something and it don't even be what it is. Or something like, for instance, we talking about the blessings of the fathers. A, a, a elder or emo will come and bless you and you, can, you won't, you'll shake it off. Because you, ain't talking about you individual, talking about like us as a people. We'll shake it off because it won't rest. That's why we were saying about um, um, about we don't have so many words because the truth of the matter is everybody that's in this building at some point has some kind of confirmation about why they're here. If they're going all the way back to maybe like before they got here or when they got here, some point there was some kind of confirmation, right? So. If we think back to those confirmations, everybody that's in this building, it, if we can really go back to that time, it'll really settle us in what we're doing right now. Because we realize, man, we went through all that and, and brought us to here. But the issue is going back to the um, to, to rejection is, rejection creates this perversion that skews your view about everything, like even your progress. It makes you think that you've made no progress. Like almost like you just all of a sudden disappeared in the assembly. Like you didn't go through all these changes and had all these deliverances and got to this place. And it'll, it'll make the place that you at seem like it's insufficient. Almost like you haven't done any work actually on your on, in, on yourself. And then at that point, everything that somebody gives brings to you will be perverted and flipped in the way to be able to open up a, a doorway for another Ruach. Right. So. This is the reason why we have to really watch um, rejection, because the rejection is the gatekeeper of every ruach, every unclean ruach. Like you, and then um, Chief talks about it in the um, in the lesson, but it's like rejection is the gateway. You open up the door, and then you don't even know what's gonna manifest at that point, right? It could be the it, that rejection. The rejection can result in, in every, everything from you killing somebody to. Um, to adultery and fornication, to um, uh, imprisonment, or whatever. But it all starts right there. So I'm just saying that. So, um, so the reason why I'm saying this, we talk about offenses. Scripture says offenses must come. But it says, woe unto them, right? Who do what? Bring the offenses, right? Because the offenses, because of the, the, the offense is to reject it. Every time there's an offense, there's somebody who feel like they was rejected. Offense is one of the homies that he be rolling with. Like I said, he, he deep. He got a whole team that's behind him. And they all depending on him to open up the door. Rejection. Right? But if we can rule over that, and what we rule over that is being, feeling like we went, accepted. Well, who would you be accepted with? Well, Yahuwah. Right? So what he does, he, he sets up a, um, a, a situation where um, he'll have certain ones who you who will bring into your life, your mo the mothers and your fathers, the elders and emas, to come and speak a word, but you got to let the word rest on you. So, so this is where it gets wild. You cannot be in sin and then not receive that word. It's the equivalent of you being in sin. It becomes sin to you. 
this is that's the wildness of it. Cause you could be not in no kind of will and sin. But the um the person that you will sends to you will give you this word and because you can't let that word rest on you for good, because what happens is a lot of times is when you're not used to receiving good, you create chaos. Because you're not comfortable in the good. You're comfortable in the chaos. So that um, now that word that's meant for you to good for good has be uh, become a type of sin because it can't rest on you and it's having the same effect because rejection comes out of that. Once that rejection comes, then everything else is perverted. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's almost like it's the same as you not. So the person who doesn't care about the order and um, the per, you know, is this has the same effect as somebody, somebody that does, but can't let the word rest on them. Do everybody catch what I'm saying? Has the same effect. And why does it have the same effect? Rejection. 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 Rejection is a cistern that can never be fixed. Listen. Rejection is a cistern that can never be fixed. It's a breach that stay, that's continual. And what will happen is, no matter what word that comes to show you up, because remember now, how are these things established? By a word. It's by the word that the words were formed. That's you know what the scripture says? Right? We look even at um, in Bereshit, where we see the words being uh, put in order by what? A word. We receive this covenant through what? A word, a blessing from a father to a son. That's all it is. Even in the, uh, the case of Ruth, it's a, it's a, it's a, a mother-in-law to a daughter-in-law. <laughs> a blessing. You understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's imperative that we can receive that word and let it cultivate. But if we can't receive it, then that's also going to turn into a, a situational occasion for offense. So that's the reason why um, I don't just keep hammering that. But that's the reason why it's so important that we have to be able to let these words rest on us. How do we let these words rest on us? By understanding the authority that, some, that we all working in. Right? So that goes back to giving double honor to those who are working in, in, in the midst of the, um, um, the walk. And what am I saying? So this is how it is. A prophet is w without honor where? That is the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is, I, <laughs> I'm going to tell you how wild this is. There are some people that's going to be in this assembly that I can sit here and try to pray for all day, and nothing's going to happen. There's somebody that's outside of the assembly going to come and pray, then they're going to get delivered. I'm just being real. And the reason why, because a, a prophet is what? In his own country. Do you know there were certain places that Yahushua went? Everybody was healed. Other places you went, went, nobody got healed. Nobody. Can you imagine you who should go into a city and nobody get healed? Right? This is why Yahuwah gives us brothers and sisters, imams and elders. Because being real, you don't need a person to get healed. You don't. You don't need a, nobody don't need no man or woman to get healed. Right? Yahuwah did that because of Imunah. Do y'all get that? Yeah. Your you, you should tell, he would tell people, just be real. By your what? Imuna. Mm -hmm. Right? But then there's people, the people who didn't believe in him, he couldn't do anything. Then on the flip side, he calls these people that he anoint this council, this elders. And because he laid hands on them by the laying hands of the elder, now they go into town and then everybody get healed because they believe that he is with them. To the point, they was passing out handkerchiefs. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Just, listen, man. The Shalakim was going into town and handing out handkerchiefs that they, that they had. People was getting delivered because they touched it. You think because the Ruach was on it? Because mm -mm, of the Imanada had and what Yahuwah had established with them. They believed that Yahushua was with them. That the authority of Yahushua had rested on them. So when they go into the town, they was like, man, these men walked with Yahushua. If they give me a blessing, that word is going to rest on me. They tell me, oh, listen, whatever they say, I'm going to believe it. They believe I'm going to be healed. 
What you about to say? Because they first received a blessing from their father. Exactly. Remember, Yahushua told them to go out. Right. And he gave them his authority. That's a blessing. Exactly what that is. So going back, so that's why Yahuwah uses men. He don't have to use no men. He don't have to use no men. But it's because of our imunah, because we have to see things. Our children are the same way. So our children can't see Yahusha, right? So the way they learn to serve Yahusha and to obey Yahusha is through imunah and their parents. It's through serving their parents and being obedient, obedient and submitted to their parents that they learn to submit to Yahusha. Because I can't see Yahusha, but I can see my mom and dad. It's the same thing in the world. Remember all these uh, televangelists, like Peter Popoff, all them crazy folks? And they hand out healing water. Get you some free healing water. Get you this kerchief. Get you this, that, and the other. There were people who were healed because their imuna was in it. It's not because he has any power. Benny he ain't got no power. But my imuna was so great in this person, like, oh man, yeah, they, you know, they, they got the power, you know. Jesus gave them healing powers. So they did, I mean, bowed, steeled to get to wherever these televangelists are so I could just be in the midst so I can get whatever healing, whatever I needed from, of course, he said Jesus, but from Yahusha, right? Because that's where the imuna was. It's the same thing here. We can't see Yahusha, but we can see Yahusha through the people that Yahusha has placed in your midst. That's how you see Yahusha. That's how you serve Yahusha. That's how you submit to Yahusha. That's how you show obedience to Yahusha. It's how you interact with the Mishpacha, how you submit to your elders. That's how you serve Yahusha. The Shalakim was walking through the streets. They said the shadow was healing people. Do you think that they had a bunch of Ruachs in their shadows? <laughs> Do you really think that's what's going on? Do you think that the Shalakim were any different as far as people than we are? Are we not men and women born of the, uh, from a woman? Right? But they knew that they walked with who? Yahushua. The truth is, people don't believe that we walk with. Right. That's it. That's what it comes down to. That's it. So that's why a prophet is going to be without honor with his own country. Because they're like, hey, they did a Yahushua. Like, man, this, this is a carpenter's son. Man, he's from Nazareth. Can anything, hey, listen, every time I heard it, I was like, man, that's Anderson. <laughs> For real. All right, man, that's, that's, that's what that is. Like, for real, it's like, oh, you from, you from Anderson. I'm like, yeah, I'm from Anderson. I <laughs> ain't getting into all that. But I usually have a chip on my shoulder about that. Like, cause, you know, I'm like, man, it, I mean, it's somebody in the world. But the gist of it is this. Um, that's how Emuna works, right? You got Emuna that you got money, even though you don't got no money. None of y'all ain't got no money. Y'all have zeros and ones on a bank account. But you got Emu now, you're going to swipe that card. You're going to get that food. Listen, this is how this stuff works. Right? So this is the gist of it. So this, so that's why I'm, I'm trying to get y'all to see that when we start talking about honor and all these other things, I'm trying to show you the, rep, the, the, the impact of that. Not for you to just talk about somebody and boost them. It's about how you benefit from that. Right? So the, we, we, uh, earlier we was, doing, we was worshiping and we was doing the yada. So if you go look up Yada, got a bunch of different meanings, right? So of course people say, well, praise, thanksgiving, right? So that word Yada also means to throw, right? So that's why you see us doing this, right? So this literally is the motion of you raising up or you lifting something up. It's like a, um, like a, uh, like a heave offering, right? To throw up, to raise up, right? It's also to know, to be intimate. So. Thanksgiving or praise, you say, man, I'm going to honor this person. I'm going to give them, I'm going to be thankful towards this person. I'm going to honor them. In the midst of that, that's how you get to know them. That's how you get to be, become in this intimacy. Why do you think that, again, um, uh, Yisak end up laying a blessing on um, Yaakov? Because he thought he was who? Because he was intimate with who? Because he made him some, some fire deer meat. For that's what it was. He like he like that deer meat. 
He, he, he wanted to queue with some cube steak. Out of, out of lamb burger. Right? Not mean lamb burger, but deer burger. Right? So he's like, man, he's gonna make he gonna make this five steak. Man, I love that dude. He give me right. He's intimate with me. Right? So I'm about to lay this blessing on him, right? So it ain't a, again, it's not about you you just trying to boost something, but it's the it's the ability because if you got that imuna in that what you you trusting in what you dealing with then everything that's unlocked is now open to you you say man why can't be healed because you're imuna because a uh, presbytery or elder then lay hands on you and told you now say who is going to do blah 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 with you and then you walk out and then hastan snatches that email right out you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you don't give you haven't given the proper honor to what is happening or the situation that Yahuwah set up, or the person that's speaking to you, right? It ain't that you hate them. It ain't about hating them like that. It's about you understanding the situation. You know what I'm saying? So saying that to say this, um, that so that's the reason why it's so important for us to understand these roles, because in the ancient, in the ancient um, Near East, when a father says something like that, it's like, oh, this is it. The father said this. You understand what I'm saying? That's the reason why he, why Esau does said the scripture says he saw it with tears. He's out there bawling and weeping of something that didn't he hadn't even came to pass yet. But he had all the emu now. He says my dad, my dad has said this. This is it. That's my dad. This is it. <laughs> right? He said this. This is what it's going to be. It's going to come to pass. Going to have full emu now, and that he is who you who said he was. I know that my father is yet sack. I know he's the son of the promise. I know my I know my uh, my uh, uh, granddad was a hundred something years old. He's saying he's still popping up, right? I know that he was um, he was he laid his life down on the altar, even though he wasn't there. He knew that that happened. You believe his testimony, so now that taste of testimony has become salvation to you. So now these words carry more weight. Right, so I'm just I'm just giving y'all this whole family dynamic, right? So um, so speaking of that, so let's look at the word elder. I'm gonna get um, the professor Yiskis. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So um, I did this one a little bit different. I have the word elder in my notes, but <clears throat> I didn't bring that notebook with me. But I'm thinking this is Yahuwah, cause I. Got another angle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, Elder Zakane. And that is H2205. And that's um, Zion Kuf Noon. Okay. And it um, typically can be translated as old. Or ancient and so older ancient and so what came to me when I was writing this probably because I know the definition of it because I've looked at it before was an old tree and then I feel like you who spoke to me at that moment and said young trees snap easily okay so then, let's go through the process here. So we're talking about this el this elder being um, an old tree, right? But it's a process to get from being this old tree from inception. So first of all, this elder has to, the land that he's planted in has to, um, the soil has to be tended to. It has to go through the tilling process. It has to have the right amount of water and nutrients for uh, in, in the in the in the sand and or in the um in the soil. And depending on what type of tree he is, he has to have a certain type of soil, right? And so he goes through all this process of preparing the ground. After the ground is prepared, then a seed can be put in the ground. But does a seed just sprout overnight? It has to be buried. And in the process of time, it will sprout up. But just because it sprouted up, 
Is it yet a tall tree? It has to continue to grow up and grow up, which is another process of time, right? To eventually, this tree has sprung up, it has sprouted, and now it is a, it's at a state where it can produce fruit. This fruit is not for the elder himself, but it's for the generations to come, right? So when looking at if you are an elder, whatever, what happens when the next generation tastes your fruit? So you are a tree and you have, you see little, little fruit begin to develop. But just because you see this little nodule of a fruit, does that mean it's time to eat it? No. Because immature fruit doesn't taste good. Right? But not only does this elder provide this fruit, but because he grows up and becomes a tree and he has fruit on his tree, he becomes a covering and he becomes a pavilion and shade for the generations to come. So an elder is rooted to bear everlasting fruit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So Ab is actually H one. Um, it's the first. It's the first word. <laughs> first word um, is Aleph Bet, of course. Um, some definitions are chief, forefather. Talks about patrimony and principle. Of course, it's the head of the household. Head of the household, family, or clan. Ancestor. Originator of, or patron of a class, profession, or a family. Originator, like where, where the family originates. It's the source. He's the source. So when you look at the letters, very simple. Um, strong leader of the house. He's the chief. Tent pole, right. The ob of the house is, I remember um, Mom brought this out. The ob of the house is that tent pole that actually sticks in the ground to uphold the um the tent so it's basically where every other piece is is being stretched from so it upholds the house hallelujah <clears throat> so um everybody got that definition everybody good you get the two definitions rep So the first one, uh, Elder Zakane, is rooted to bear rooted to bear everlasting fruit. And it it can. She said it could be good or bad. Yep. <laughs> um because, as a matter of fact, so I had done a breakdown for the name Abimelech. So dealing with Ab right. and Melech, my father is king. And Abimelech was one, the eldest son of um, Gideon. And um, so in the breakdown, I looked at how his source was, um, was a king. It was Hasatan. And so um, he he reproduced that. So there there's like positive and negatives to to an elder or to a father. You know the, um, the scriptures talks about how the the Gentiles will come and say that we've inherited lies. Right. That stuff came from their fathers, and they realized it was bad. It came from their elders. Right. So Zakain, 
rooted to bear everlasting fruit. Which is why some people can't receive a word from you. Because they're rooted to receive everlasting fruit from their father. Right. So it also, it also depends on that's also a factor of like can you be in a house? Yeah. Because you have to we have to figure out who your father is. Right. Yeah, so um so when we talked about earlier about just because you in a you come in a house don't necessarily mean that you're part of a house. Because your father might be of somebody else, right? And again, it's, it's not like it's not a shot. It just that's the truth. If you can't, it, it's no way. Oh, so okay, this is another fact. If you can't receive from that person and apply, that's not your father. Everybody hear me? If you can't receive and apply. What you what you um I'm sorry, I'm, let me say this a little bit better. If you can't receive and apply what's given to you by the representative, that's not your father. Another quick definition of a being or a son from the culture standpoint, not from a literal standpoint, from like being. But the being is the sum of his father. The daughter is the sign of her father's house. And the reason why I'm talking about this being being the sum of the father is that so if you say that, okay, I'm in the tribe, you're like, oh, this is my dad, but you haven't applied nothing that that person has told you, that is not your dad. That's not your father. It's not. If you say that that's my father, but you don't bear the sign of him, that's not your father. You're not his daughter. You're not. So this goes back to the obedience. Um, and that's what I'm saying about how um, you have to be, it's the father, the son doesn't identify the, the, the father, nor the daughter, daughter, the mother, it's the mother and the father that identifies the son and the daughter. Based on your actions or your fruit. A fruit, or like we just talking about the elder, the Zycane is going to have fruit. It's going to produce fruit like itself. Right? If this tree is oranges, it's not going to produce apples. That's not his son. That's not his seed. Everybody get it? This is about the simplest way you can get it. That's why scripture says you know a tree by his, right? Every fruit is going to do what? Bear seed after its own kind. Every fruit, write that down, is bearing seed of its own kind. That goes back to the ob, uh, probably the ob, uh, but the um, but the zakane. What you're seeing is the zakane and ob uh, is the same thing. Everybody get me? So going back to this, so just because you in the house, you might be in the house because you know what, I, what the houses did in the, in the past? They took in strangers. But you're still a stranger unless you're the son of the father or the sign of the father's house. Go, go ahead. Write that down what I just said too. You are a stranger until you, you become the son of the father or a sign of the father's house. Hallelujah. So I want to just confirm what you're saying about when you say that the that Zakane and Ab, we see that they're the same thing, and they are. Because when I talked about there's a tree, which is a trunk, and then there's Ab, which is the pole. 
and the 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 leaves and the um, fruit on the tree is covering, and in the father's house the curtains is what's covering. So you that's his, that's the fruit that's hanging that covers the family. So both ways is covered. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Of the, you are a stranger until you become the sum of the father or a sign of the father's house. Don't get snared into thinking that's an age thing. You could have came into um, the tribe and been 60 years old and still become a daughter, still become a sign of the house. Six-year-old man can still become a son because you have to understand that it's Yahuwah that's fathering you through his representative. And he has no age. He's eternal. Um, and Yiska's um, definition, it, it reminds me of, we said it earlier, what Mori Musha said is about, it's not about the age, it's the Ruach, it's on the individual. So um, that, that ancient definition when you see elder um that thing has been from the beginning it's it's a it's a it's it's the eternal ruach that's on an individual to help them be able to guide father or mother you so that's what Amar is saying you can be 70 years old and uh or 60 years old and somebody in the house can be 30 or 40 but if their eternal if their ruach is eternal then yahuwah has um, them to be able to um, add functionality to you, add wholeness to you, add the ability to to um, to be a part of the house through the eternal rock that's resting on them, which was placed by Yahuwah. So this word is, um, we talking about houses. Go ahead, go ahead, Elder, go ahead. Yeah, so um, that's very interesting because um, we see a situation with um, Mashiach when he was talking to the who was it, the, the Pharisees he was talking to? When it says, he asked them, um, what do you guys think about the Mashiach? Right? Whose son is he? And they say, he's Dawood's son. And then he asked him, he says, so why did Dawood say, right? My master said to my master, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. So we have to look at things a little bit different. And um, I kind of see that people take the age thing um, a little bit too, too far and it's because of, of the lack of understanding. We have to understand now that we are, we're, not, we're no longer walking after the flesh, but we are walking after the Ruach. Right? So if you definitely believe that, then that's the way you have to start thinking. And that's the way you start, have to start operating. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you, you set that up perfect. Because like the, some of the, the conversations you has been speaking to me. And um, specifically today, while we were like praising Warren, um, one of the things I kept, um, first it was um, a word about um, heaviness. And then Yahuwah was showing me um, it was connected to defiled offerings because of the heaviness. And the root of it was self-sabotage. And so there was many people that he was showing me the self-sabotage came because the door is open. He said, I forgave you. He said, come into my house. And literally the door is open, but people are sitting in a corner scared. Like the, the video Hana sent with, with um, him and Ha, staying in that place and tormenting yourself. And so... Um, to the word that Elder literally just gave, um, Yahuwah reminded me again, and um, Chief brought out a whole lesson on this, but for if you live according to Romans 8, starting at 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as led, sorry, for as many as are led by the spirit of Elua, these are sons of Elua. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, which is Abba, my ancestor, connected to Ab. That was one of the definitions, was ancestor. And so I'm sitting here, and because we're war tribe, I'm always thinking of how I can dismantle 
the attacks of the enemy. And so the biggest, like, it's, it's like a, and I spoke about this, like, in our personal house, but fear and condemnation is like a nuke that the enemy uses to keep you in bondage. And so all of us have came through a natural parent who was just a vessel to bring us into this. So we can think about them, our natural parents, as being our foster parents. We were in a foster house, and we were brought forth under these wicked Torahs, under um, them teaching us a certain way to live and move. And so now, here Yahuwah sends forth his son, Yahusha, your kinsman redeemer, to come and adopt you because you no longer have the spirit of bondage but of adoption by which we call Abba Father. So now he's coming to adopt you. But have you ever heard of those stories of people who get adopted and then they get into that house and they sabotage in order to go back into the same bondage that they hated? And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing when we give into condemnation, when we give into fear, when we give into our flesh. Because at verse 13 says, for we do not live, for we did not, for if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit you put the, to death the deeds of the body and you shall live. And so every time that Hasatan tries to come with lies of our mind of things that we've confessed to elders, time and time again things that we have been um the elder has literally told you you've been forgiven you who has forgiven you and released you of that thing every time you play it in your mind you're walking towards self-sabotage so this is what's wild so i'm gonna read what she, what she just said it says therefore 12 therefore brethren we are not dead to the flesh right not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if you live after the flesh you shall do what but through the Ruach do mortify, kill, that means kill. Yes. The deeds of the body you shall live. So she, she said that, you always told me, like, man, the rock hit me. It's a body for a body. So what do they call the body? That's the family. So he's, ta he's literally telling you, Detroit, it's two different families. You're mortifying the deeds of your old family. You're killing them, because that's your father. That's how now you will say, Abba, my ancestor. How all of a sudden Abba become my ancestor? Because now I mortify the deeds of my old family. That was the body. That's the body that I came from. That's why that always says what? It says, in sin was I conceived. Right? I, can't, I, I, I was born in iniquity. How could somebody, he wasn't born out of wedlock. But he was raised in a certain fashion. So now I'm taking those things. So everybody, you know why people can't be immersed to the tribe? Because of their family dynamic. All these coaches that you got from your father, because you, uh, you was the sign of your father's house, and you was the son of your father who was not following you. That's what it was. And now you come to this place, and you try to, and you say that you call him Abba Father, but then Ab, who sends his son to go minister to you, and then you can't receive him. You can't be conform In order for you to be conforming to an image, you got to know what it looks like. So going back, so, so saying this to say something, you said that, again, we do mortify the deeds of that body because the, the body is the family. The deeds of the body shall live. For as many are led by the rock of the Lord, or they are the sons of the Lord. He just told you. It's a different group. It's, it's a, because it's a, this is the issue going back to, to what I'm saying is that we just read in numbers. The first thing they did was they said, what? Arrange the families. Because these are the families that's going to go forth. Now these people are called by the name. So we even talk about the name Yahuwah a lot. But if you go back and look, they really went, they didn't really know the name of Yahuwah to Moshe went to Sinai. Mm -hmm. After that, they come out with the name of Yahuwah. Right? When Moshe went up, Yahuwah says, you know, before then they didn't know me by my name. They was calling me, you know, they don't know me by uh, what? Yeah, all should die in El Leon. That's all they knew him by. He says, but now you're going to know me by my name, Yahuwah. Why? Because you become part of this family. The assembly of what? Firstborn. Firstborn. So just uh, land back on the elder and what Shah just said. As soon as you said that, that's like, man, that's what that is. That's the, you're mortifying those deeds. Because you, only, you can only know and do what you've seen. That's it. Scripture says we... Speak what we and testify to. 
That's all you ever can do. You can't imagine something that you haven't heard. Do y'all know if y'all know this? You can't imagine something that you haven't heard. That's the reason why scripture talks about evil imaginations. This is the reason why Yahuwah said that he was trying to do it with all the idols. Because the idols led to what? Evil imaginations. God gates in your ear gates. What's what you perceive. Because you be in a place and you perceive things to be a certain way. You perceive how a father um, uh, needs to act. But that father is not uh, unsubmitted to Yahuwah. You perceive how a mother needs to act who is not submitted to Yahuwah. You perceive how a uh, 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 daughter acts um, uh, not submitted to Yahuwah. How relationships unsubmitted to you who it needs to go how this um dating process which is not submitted to you who needs to go all these different things interactions all this stuff so you learn all these things in that body and that's where the preference comes in you got to do away with what you prefer and walk in what's expedient towards the building up of the house so we got to figure out like we discussed earlier what's expedient for the restoration of these houses which leads to the eventual building of a nation, which leads to the establishment of the kingdom of Yahuwah, not your preference, not who you were, not what you were raised in, not doing what you know or knew, but what is expedient for going forward towards this goal. So let's just keep reading what you what you say and what Shah just said. Then he says, listen, for us men led by the Ruach of the sons of Allah. So he's saying this is a family. He's talking about these sons. Now you got this family that's, that's all, it's, it's not even blood, it's Ruach. It's, so what's greater, blood or ruach? For you have not, so uh, anyway, for you have not received the rock of bondage again, the fear, but you cried the spirit, the rock of what? Adoption. Ad the bond woman can't be the mother of a free son of inheritance. He has to be born to a free woman. This, <laughs> Man, he says the Ruach bear witness with our Ruach that we are the children of the Lord. This group, this group. So he's saying who? We assembly of the firstborn. He's not talking about people outside of that assembly. He listen when he wrote this, he wasn't talking about them people's um, families that wasn't in that assembly. He wasn't. It's it's. Ain't it? Ain't it how I address? Listen, 17. If children and heirs, heirs of the Lord, joint heirs of Mashiach, if so, we suffer with him that we may be glorified in him. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are worthy to be compared with the compared which should be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of the Lord. For the creature which made subject to vainly, not willingly. We've been talking about this, right? By reason who have subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the liberty of the children of Allure is that it's the first family. That's the rock of adoption. Why? Because you've mortified the members of that old body, that old man, that connection, that bloodline's been is you no longer operating in that mode. So going back to what I was gonna say, so this is the idea of a tribe. So let's say if you if if you they they captured you and they dropped you off on the continent somewhere, and now you gotta go join the Ashanti, you gotta go join the Ebo. You got to go join the Yoruba. You got to go join um, the, you know, the Hottentots or whatever, whatever tribe it is. Now you drop, drop you off over there. You're not going to come in there with your Americanized family dynamic. You're not. You are not. In most of these situations, you have to renounce and denounce your family in order to be a part of their family, especially if you are so happen to be able to marry into royalty. You're considered a commoner, right? Now you have to give up your family in order to be a part of their family. That's what happened with Meghan Markle, right? When she married Prince Harry and that, all that craziness was happening, she had to renounce and denounce her family in order to be part of their family. You can't just come in there with all, and her family's trying to come with some crazy, right? But they weren't going to receive her family dynamic. The issues with her father, whatever, was, you love your mama, great, but she ain't part of this family. 
right? And we always been like, man, are they crazy? Nah, they upheld a standard. If you are going to be in this family, this is what it is. But we come in with our, our Western mindsets of like, we just going to debo everybody and do what we want, where we want, when we want, how we want. And that is not how order works. That's dysfunctional. So you got to say it. I, I, I jump in. So I was just going to say that that scenario that you just brought up, they just dropped you off. That's what happened. Right. They took us out of Spain and Portugal was just dropping us off with these tribes. And the, the first ones to get captured and to not survive was the ones that would not submit. Right. They would not come in and submit to the order of the tribe that was established. It was um, a lot of data that, that you and... Um, um, Benaya, we're bringing out um, on the documentary, on the docuseries, Reclaiming the Throne, that you were showing that there were instances where the people who were brought in, our, a lot of our uh, ancestors that were brought in from Spain and Portugal, when they came into these places, they wouldn't even talk to them. Right. Their own brothers. Because they was carrying their family dynamic, right. their corrupted family dynamics that they had in Spain and Portugal, they brought that into this environment where they could have it could have been a sanctuary for them, right. a covering. And there were some who it was a covering for, some who were able to come in and submit themselves humble, take on families and help add to the community and stuff like that. Till ultimately they all came and got got. But there were some who were able to um, receive a blessing because they honored new fathers and new mothers. Right. Yeah, it's funny because I've just. Um, as Ak about that, and he was saying that he ain't really even seen that process before. Somebody trying to come in. This is this is what I'm saying about how how rare this is when you what you who is trying to do with this specific um, family. And um, uh, Mo also talked about this a couple times about the House of Yahoo when they we, we, we talk about the whole thing. Um, but the House of Yahoo. Matter of fact, you want to speak on that? We want to sum it down. Can we? Yeah, just, get a summary. just to to give a summary, that's that different ruach that we were talking about with Caleb and um, Yahusha, um, and even Othaniel, um, his brother who became a judge. All the judges, they had a distinct relationship with Yahuwah where they were able to deal with him. Even um, the Malak Yahuwah visited these people because they were from a, a, a set apart seed. So um, of course we know there's the two houses of Yasserel the northern kingdom of Yasserel and um, the southern kingdom of Yehuda. But there is um, one who is from the seed of Yahuwah, one that he gives to the people so that they can be grafted into him. And so that is the, um, in the, the prophecies of uh, specifically uh, Husha or Hosea, it says it calls them um, Jezreel as Hosea's eldest son. And it says even in Hosea, um, it says it in Hosea 1 and 2 that basically the, um, the other two children, one representing the northern kingdom, the other the southern kingdom, are going to elect for themselves one head, an elder, their brother Jezreel, which Jezreel means scattered seed. And it says that he represents the house of Yahu. There was a man named Jehu, which Jehu is just Yahu. And it says that we'll call him Jezreel because he represents the house of Yahu. That he was the one who was responsible. He was the one who was judged first. Now, uh, Shaul goes on in Romans to talk about how it was given to the Yahudi the oracles. Right. It was given you the priesthood, the establishment, the uh, adoption of sons, all these things because... In Daud, Yahuwah hid his house in Daud. So now, before, in the time of the judges, it was appearing in all these different tribes. It'd be Othaniel, then it'd be, um, what's the dude uh, from Benjamin? Left-handed man? Oh. Yeah, no. Who did you say? Ehad, Ehad yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, then it was Samson from Dan, all these different people. But then when he established that covenant with Daoud, he was saying, I'm putting it in your house. Right. And that's where it's going to manifest. The oracles of Elohim, his seed, right. the house of Yahoo, his person, 
his yaqid, a nation of that, that would that both houses would be able to um, elect as their head and be able to represent them before the father. That's a nation of kings and priests. That is the birthright. That's it. That's what's prophesied of Yehuda in uh, Genesis 39 or 49, where it says that to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. That that word for peoples is Ami. That's bloodlines. All the bloodlines are gonna have to submit to this one, this nation that comes out of Yehuda, because it is Yahuwah's seed that he has made to manifest. His house, his sons. The, the sum of him right. and his daughters, the sign of his house. Hallelujah. So I want to say this and then we're going to uh, move on. But so going back to that, if you was going to try to engraft yourself in a tribe, the first thing you have to do is sit down and soak up that culture and become that tribe. That's what we see with, um, where again, to my root, where she had to sit down and then she was like, man, your lure is going to be my lure. Your people going to be my people. I'm going to learn how to become a sign of that house. I'm going to do whatever y'all say. And, and because of that, he, she, got in the, she ended up getting engrafted into the royal family. Right? So this is the process of what we're saying. That's, that was her mortifying her members. When she gave up the Moabite um, ideals, culture, lifestyle, nation, and everything. And said, okay, now I'm going to become this. I'm going to learn how to become um, literally one of the Yehudi. Right. Hallelujah. So um, we got um, a couple more definitions. We're gonna wrap up. Ima, yeah. So Ima, we know Ima is in Hebrew, the Aleph and the Mem. And I'm going to kind of just take some stuff from this. So the word uh, mother is am um, or m um, is represented in Paleo-Hebrew with the letters Aleph and Mem. The connotation of this word is strong water, meaning the water is abundant and plentiful. In the Hebrew language, there is function associated with that, though. So another meaning of the letter Mem is chaos. So you might say, well, I could kind of get strong water, but I kind of don't get chaos. So a mother's instruction can lead her child to order and perspective. It can be nourishing. It can lead her child to Yahuwah, to his laws, his statutes, his commands. Or her instruction can lead the child to chaos. Or the lack of presence of a mother can lead a child to chaos. Strong water can mean giver, sustainer of life. So for example, it's the mother's amniotic fluid that the baby rests in inside the womb. It's the unbiblical cord that connects the child to the mother, where the child gets a source of nourishment. Even after birth, the mother nursing her child, giving her baby sustenance directly from her body. This is strong water. The absence of mother, so I'm going to give you another Hebrew word that has the am um or the mother in the word. Ame, that's um, transliterated as A-H-M-A-Y, but you can see the aleph and the mem in that word. The root word of that word is um, which is the same word for mother. It describes an understanding in Hebrew that when there's no mothering, and that when there's no one that's faithful in a child's life to provide that strong water or that nurture, fear and terror come upon the child. So um, we can say that ima, the aleph and the mim, the words together mean strong water, or it can mean um, strong chaos. Um, so, another word that has the root word of am um, for mother in it to give you just more understanding is the word leom. That the um, the am is at the end of it. The e, the aleph mem is at the end of that word. That's the word for nation. So you can you know kind of speculate. Well, why is the word mother connected to the word nation? So when you look at the word leom for nation, it's lamed aleph mem. The lama meaning the staff or the authority. So what that word is basically saying is the staff or the authority of the father given to the mother to establish the nation. Right? That word is leom. It's spelled transliterated L-E-O-M. 
Yeah. The staff, the lama represents the staff or the authority of the father. And then the Aleph Mem is mother. So it's the staff being given to the mother for establishing the nation or the house. So, um, all right, say that again, Mom. The mother's teaching is, but, but what the mother is teaching is the statutes, the laws, and the commandments of the father. So the, the, the word for nation is leom. It's spelled lamet, aleph, mem. The root word is aleph, mem. That's mother or ima, or m. So the connotation of that word is lamet, the staff or the authority of the father given to the mother to establish the nation. So the mother is teaching the law of the father, the statute of the father, the commandment of the father. And in doing that, she's providing strong water, nourishment to the child so that a nation can be established. So, um, so again, so Ma, you said that the, she's, you said uh, um, the lamb and the rest of it is what now? <laughs> Aleph Mim. Aleph Mim. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Lamed, Aleph, Mim. And then you said it's what? The, the establishing of what? It's my word, Leom. the establishing of the nation. The word Leom actually means nation. So understand that every nation is established by mothers. Right. Every nation. Deborah. Yes. Right? Because it, um, it was chaos until she showed up. She's, it says in the scripture in Judges, until I, Deborah, a mother in Israel, arose that people were so fearful they wouldn't even come out of their homes. So it's Remember it says, I just told you, that the absence, the word ame, is the absence of a mother. The word actually means terror and dread, and that's the result of an abs the absence of a mother. So you said staff, um, a staff brung to the strong waters? Um, well, that could be too, but what, what I was actually saying for the word nation is a staff given to the mother. All right, so let's check this out. Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the sinners or sit in the seat of the, song, of the scornful. His delight is a Torah of Yehoah, and in his Torah he doth meditate, meditate day and night. He is like an ob planted by the rivers of water, the strong water. The mother and the father. Now, what you just said also reminded me of Moshe when he put the staff in right, the water. Right, the nation was established. established they were all nation. immersed into Moshe. Hallelujah. They became one family. Hallelujah. Right? So, again, he showed, that's the ob, uh, right, tree, right, planted by the rivers of water. That word rivers is plague. It means, like, streams. That's your strong water. That's fast-moving water, right? Consistent, right? Which bringing forth his fruit in due season. Now, what's the definition of um, uh, elder or zakain? It's a, fru a fruitful tree, right? Rooted to bear everlasting fruit. Mm -hmm. Rooted to bear everlasting fruit. Okay. Right. Rooted to do what? Bear everlasting fruit. All right. So this man. Is like a ob, right, or a tree planted by the rivers of water, the strong waters, the ema, to bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaves shall what? Not wither. And whatsoever you do, he shall prosper. Now read the definition again. The definition of zakain. What is it? That means it will not wither. It will not die. Whatever it do, whatever um, he establishes to do, it will do what? But it has to be nourished by water, by strong water, right? Because it's him, it's the water that nourishes the ab or the tree, the zakain, that brings forth the fruit. It, it reminds me of the context of the tree of life. Uh, a tree that brings forth eternal fruit, but we know that in the garden there were also flowing streams. I wanted to say that too because we have to look at that because a lot of times as women, we'll focus on the children as the only um, 
our, our biggest responsibility. But it all, it's actually that the, the strong water is also nourishing the tree so that the tree can bring forth the fruit of the children, right? So Imad has a dual, dual function. She's nourishing the ab or the tree, but she also nourishes the children. Yeah, I, um, you are. Shout out to Do you feel nourished? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Very nourished out here. So I, w I was sitting here thinking about when uh, my mom was saying how, um, you know, Leon um, means nation and um, how, um, you know, the arm is at the end of it. And without the presence of a mother um, to, you know, in the establishment of a nation, there's a bunch of chaos that goes on. And I thought about this um, involving um, like my own daughter. Um, so I used to wonder why whenever Sha would leave, she would just like get chaotic and just scream. I'm like, man, what is happening? Right? Is, I'm, I'm like, is it me? I'm like terror and dread, it's like, ah. And, I'm, I'm, and, and then the wisdom was given to me that she has no concept that her mom is ever going to return again. And this is when she was young, like young, young. And it reminds me of what Amal was saying about the nation. When the mother is not present, all there is is chaos, screams, and terror, right? Until that mother returns um, to help with the establishment and the stability of that nation, um, the nation can never properly um, function. And, um, you know, Yahuwah just reminded me of that uh, with my own daughter. So praise Yahuwah that, that she's gotten past that place. But that was something he ministered to me when she was young, is um, just the need for her mother to be there for that stability. Can I um, speak one more thing concerning Emma or M? So let's think about mothers who are single mothers, okay? When there's no ob, there's no strong pole to hold the tent up. So now you have the mother in the tent with the children. She's trying to hold the tent up and nourish the children. It's impossible. It's impossible to do because the ob has one function, to stand there and to hold the tent up. So now we have a mother who's trying to hold the tent up and trying to provide nourishment to the children as well. And some of us came from homes like that where the mother was trying to hold the tent up and nourish the children at the same time. So we need to have compassion for an, in, and understanding in that she was likely doing the best that she could with an impossible task. Right. Those who are single mothers in this tribe, you've been planted into households. Stop trying to hold the tent up by yourself. Yeah. You're not built to do it. And it's an impossible task. That's a Babylonian it is a Babylonian concept. I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan. It's an abomination. I'm going to do all, everything a man can do, I'm going to do it better. We can't, we're not wired for it. We're not wired for it. And Yahuwah has made provision. The people that taught us that don't do that. They don't. They never did that. Mm -mm, they force us to work in their house. <laughs> it's going to be your grandmama that was keeping them up. Literally breastfeeding them. Why are they talking about you need a, you don't need no man? Yeah, so Amahi said something earlier about, um, so now we see, we understand, like, um, where you is showing a picture of the Ab and Amah. We see why, when it's when the scripture says, when Shaul says, rebuke not an elder, but treat him as an Ab, you understand what that means. That means that this person is, is hold up the entire house, right? Or the younger man is brethren. Same thing, strong wall. The, the elder women as Amaz, and the young women as sisters. He's telling you, this is, so he's talking about what? At that time, it was, the, it was the assembly, but that's the tribe. He's telling you this is the same dynamic of a tribe. So these things are paramount that we're able to perceive it, operate in it, and be able to um, be recognized as in line with Yahuwah's vision concerning the family, 
right? Because this whole thing is about a family. That's why um, Shaul says, he says that marriage is a mystery. That's what he says. That's what he's talking about, the Ab and the Amah. It's a mystery because when they can come together in righteousness, now the nation is, is reborn again. But it's about these families, and it's about the, um, the establishment of it. That's the reason why they couldn't go back. They couldn't move out until it was establishment of houses. Our tribe, we have elders in our tribe. Tell me some things that you see them doing. You know they're doing these things. My case. They're being uh, fathers, uh, being husbands. They um, are establishing their, their own homes. They're mentoring. Uh, teaching, um, sharing, sharing love and knowledge. Tell me some practical stuff too. Practical, hands-on, you can see it. Love, okay. you can't see love, what do you see? Doing work, uh, building things um, for, the, for the nation, uh, cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, repairing. Everything that you can think of, <laughs> fixing, fixing, uh, doing repairs. Uh, moving people in, mm -hmm. uh, whatever whatever you could think of, you can see them doing it pretty much. Okay. Hallelujah. Take a couple more, maybe. Um, from a practical standpoint, they're also covering where there's like a financial lack, where there's an emotional lack, um, or where they may just like the way that support is needed. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, they're helping prepare, give counsel, being just a shoulder um, whenever you need that love and that extra support. Um, there's be, there being the foresight or the, um, not the foresight, but being able to look and see areas in you that you can't see. Mm -hmm. um, so the, they're just there. Um, from a uh, practical standpoint from my personal experience, I see them being like a gibbering in a strong wall, but I've also experienced them being an intercessor for me and my children, like when I didn't even have the strength to go on or I didn't have the means to do, I've seen them cover. So I've seen them cover the the widow and the orphan with me being a, pretty much a widow myself and my children being fatherless. So I want us, I want us to stop calling them fatherless because they're not fatherless. They got a lot of fathers. Hallelujah. One last thing for me. I want you to tell me what you see the Imayo doing in this assembly, in this tribe, what some of them are doing right now. They're um, being watchful. Mm -hmm. observant their the insight that they have even when you don't even realize that you are going through something they speak to that thing <laughs> um, they're pouring into us um, re revealing revelations uh, um, the time that they offer um, the shoulders that they give to cry on um, they are covering us when we are weak, um, casting out stuff that we, we don't even realize we have. <laughs> they spend countless hours talking about us as we, after we go home and in, in our beds, they're here talking about us. <laughs> 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 There's so much. We can go on and on. I mean, it's day in and day out. This is, this is what they do. This is their life. It's us. They're covering us all day long, running up and down the street trying to figure out how to protect us from what's coming, preparing, getting us ready for what's coming, putting together homes and, and listening to Yahuwah on their knees praying and listening and, and receiving and bringing it back to us and feeding it to us. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, building a nation, building the kids up right now and not a lot, so to speak. Um, making sure they're cared for, they having the proper nutrition. Um, just being loving and kind. Um, being uh, someone you can talk to that can counsel you, um, help you make righteous decisions, and um, pretty much they help you grow as a woman. And I say for me, because I'm single woman, um, you can you, you can know you can cry on their shoulders, and they'll be able to help you to grow and to become a Ima. You know, one day, um, even even. Um, I'm just thinking about the practical things. Mm -hmm. um, helping um, in all the ministries areas. So we have, you know, when we have the covenant wedding, you have the Emas taking the charge over that, making sure that we are um, helping out to make this covenant go forth. Um, you have the Bana admins, you know, you have the reflections, making sure that we are being... Um, given the right substance and we wake up early to do that you know and they it's from all over the country not just here you have people all the way in dallas and you know different times so they're getting up at six in the morning and they important into us so it's so much that i can just say about the emas hallelujah um, gang, gang, gang. young people back there want to say something Hallelujah. Um, at least from my personal experience, I could say that a mother's words can hurt sometimes, but it only hurts because it's the truth. Sometimes you know you're wilding out, but it's a, only your mother that has to come over and be like, you know you're wilding out, right? You, you know you're acting crazy. You'd be like, but Ma, no. No. So hallelujah. I have my mother to speak truth to me. <laughs> well, one of the things that I wanted to say was um, I see them helping more now than what they used to, especially um, the Emas that help in um, Nakala. And I see them like helping bring up the other, the next generation that's gonna come even after our, us. And so it's crazy because like, you can see the children growing as well, it, like even the toddlers, because when we're doing praise and worship, they're also starting to praise with us now. And so, yeah, that's all I want to say is I see them helping with the next generation, so yes. Good question. I just wanted to give a shout out to the Zakane and the uh, Imayok with, um, Hallelujah. We had the elders come up. Yeah. And the emails come up. Where well, the ones that's in here. Praise you, Hoosier. And so also what I wanted to add was um mom was given the definition of Emayo. One of the things that um that I remember reading as well is the strong waters also glue. And so the Emayo, and I'm also going to add the Zarkane to that as well, they do a lot of things that hold everything together. Right. Going back to all the things that Yakira was talking about, she can just, a list, can just go on and on on this list. And um, just like Akmar Keith, this list that goes on and on, it's all strong water, it's all glue to help hold everything together. I, wanna, I just want to say, Ima Kasha, who is the oldest Ima in the assembly, Ima is close to 80. Yeah, she's close to 80. She's right now in Baby Nation taking care of babies. Hallelujah. Yeah, and if she wasn't doing that this week, she would be in here praising as hard as we praise, warring as hard as we war, harder than some of us. So, okay, we're going to get them because we just want to honor them. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to tell you that every wedding feast, every wedding feast that we've had, the Imayot have almost completely by themselves paid for it. You hear what I'm saying? From the food to the decorations to even some items for the bride. The Imayot do that. And I want to just honor them for that. Because every wedding feast we've had has been absolutely beautiful. Let's clap and stay walking in. Yeah. I want to thank the Zakane. I want to honor them because it's an elder that keeps the bathrooms running. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's an elder. That's Elder Yoab that gets in there with that. That's not a fun job. I want to thank um, all of the elders for everything they do. Elder Asaya cooks. <laughs> and builds. And builds. And pressure washes. <laughs> hey, I don't know if y'all saw the front of the building. That was on the side. That thing was squeaky clean out there, man. Sparkling. Hallelujah. Sparkling. And mentors. And there, if you call him and ask him to do something, he's going to do he it. it. To the best of his ability. Elder Ahmad, same thing. Elder Ahmad's here every week cleaning. Hallelujah. Faithfully. Cleaning Faithfully. stuff that nobody else want to do. Doing things that are not, you know, fun tasks. But he's consistent to do it. And if we call for the elders to do anything, he's the first one there, no lie. Early, early to do it. Elder Hadashah. Elder Hadashah. Who is our elder over our children's ministry. Hallelujah. <laughs> he's in our children's ministry sometimes 12, 13 hours at a time in there with the children overseeing them and protecting them and nurturing them. I can't tell you how many times I walked through there and seen him holding a child and comforting a child. And some of our children who don't have a father in their physical home are receiving that nurture, that correction, that instruction, that comfort from him when they're here. And so we appreciate him for that. Also, he is a master carpenter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he fixes just about whatever you can name that needs to be fixed. And, and we thank him because he's quick to do it. And then um, I definitely don't want to forget my husband, Elder Yoab. Hallelujah. Uh, Elder Yoab is at all things to all people. <laughs> he's triple A out here. <laughs> Pulling people out of mud, out of ditches. Changing tires, doing oil changes. Ma, don't forget he an axe man too. Yeah, <laughs> chopping down trees and branches, building things as well. Um, you know, teaching the thing that's really I, I really love about him is he's patient. And um, you know, a lot of the young men, yes, he's a counselor. A lot of the young men don't know how to, well, they're learning. I won't say they don't know how. They're, they're learning to work with their hands, to build things, to tend to animals and things like that. And he's very patient in his instruction. He, something that he could probably do in four hours, he'll let it take 12 hours so that each young man has an opportunity to learn so that they can have that skill under their belt. So I just really appreciate his patience and his diligence. Hallelujah. And, um, and then you can see all of the, the beautiful Imayo that we have. And you see how many of them had to be brought into the room because they're working right now. Hallelujah. 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 So I want you to know we don't take the title of Ima lightly. We don't just hand that out at the door. Though we honor the elders, we honor every elder, we don't believe that every elder woman or every elder man has the ability to lead in the assembly the moment right. they arrive. So we, we require them to go through classes and, and go before the elders and be proven before we regard them with those titles. Though we may love and honor them before they have those titles, we do still require that they be proven in order to be called those things because when you put the, the name Ema on a woman, that, that makes your guard go down for some. 
instantly your guard goes down and instantly you trust that counsel and instantly you want to listen to them and do what they say. That's if you're an obedient daughter. So when you hear Ema on a woman's name, that automatically want, causes you to want to obey, right? And so we're very careful about saying Ema. So they've been through classes. They've committed themselves to this tribe, to the furthering of the seed. If you ask any one of them, they're going to tell you that their life centers around the furthering of the seed. That's, that's what we believe, and that's what we work towards. And so um, I personally want to honor each one of you, and I know Maury does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, two mics. I mean, when I say you really can't say <laughs> much more because y'all do a ton. Each individual, whether it be in Baby Nation, whether it be in, um, um, uh, I don't know why I can't say the word right now. Top Nation, what's the Nakala. Um, all the help that y'all do in all those things um, is, is you know, we, we praise you for y'all. Everybody will double honors to the elders and to the Emas, to the Zakane and the Emo. Double honors. They deserve it. Like I said, that's, that's the glue, that's the backbone. Um, everybody you see that's up here, they're integral in making everything happen. Sometimes things be happening so smooth, we forget how. Because they run everything in the background. Like, our elders and our emas take care of all the background stuff that we don't think of. And so it just seems like it just appears. Like, you know how kids think that food just appears in the house? <laughs> it's kind of like the same thing here. Like, things just appear. That's in the cleaning team. We think that just happens magically. Right. We leave and then, you know, Malakim come and just clean the assembly. It's just, it's just clean. You know, so our, our, um, they do so much for us. And, you know, I got a special place in my heart for Ema gang. Gang, gang. <laughs> you know, and um, it's not a competition, but I think they're the best. I love my Eva game, but it's not came out here, though. Huh? It's not came out here. That the first is I came out here in Israel. <laughs> they out here, man. I came out here warm and then go build something afterwards. <laughs> they gonna save you on the side of the road. Shout out. Gotta get a double honor to the Eva's and the Zakane out here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, I feel like I, I, we gotta roll out. I can roll with the elders. It's still gonna get done. The children are probably losing their minds. Yeah. Right. So, oh, yeah. we'll let you head back. That one, too. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, we got, um, we got, I got one more script for y'all, then we're going to um, give homework and wrap it. All right? So, we've been talking about, um, the establishment of houses. We've been talking about this, um, the Zakane. We've been talking about the Ah. We've been talking about the Ima, right? Those roles. And, we, you know, we talked about Psalms 1 and being planted by the rivers of waters and the Leom, the nation, how those things tie in, the, the concept of honor and how it plays a role in it. Being seen, um, being seen, uh, being um, in good standing with the, um, with the council or leadership, or with the Abs, the Emas, the elders, is not about uh, man worship. It's about the functionality of honor within the tribe. It's about the functionality of honor within the tribe. It's also dependent on your blessing. It's, it's dependent on the um, the fruit continuing, right? We talk about how that that tree is planted by the rivers of waters, and its its, it's leaves don't wither. The fruit continues. Because um, of this uh, planting or this um, settling in the will of Yahuwah. Everybody got me? I was talking about these houses. So what I was, Yahuwah had me look at this. I ain't never seen this before. We all talk about Psalm 68. We want to battle somebody about who you, what Yahuwah's name is, right? But Psalm 68 verse 4, listen to what it says. Sing unto Yahuwah, or Lua. Sing praise to his name, and stole him by him that ride upon the, the Shamaim by his name, Yahoo, or Yahuwah, and rejoice before him. This is what it says, verse 5. 
a father to the fatherless. That's the ob we're talking about. Fa people that have been who've mortified their members, right? And now they're, they're part of this family, the family of Yahoo, right? Children of Yahuwah, children of the Lord. A father to the fatherless, listen, a judge of who? He judges, he not executing the widows, he's executing for the widows. He's pleading their case. Is a lure in this court of habitation. Listen what he says, verse 6. A lure said that the solitary in families. Yahuwah said it the solitary. So I'm like, the solitary? You know what that is? That's the Yaqid. He says he sets the Yaqid in the families. So that means he, remember we talked about this, man, so if y'all remember what the Yaqid, somebody give me a definition of, of Yaqid. I heard five definitions. Somebody give me a definition. So I get a mic and give me a definition. Chosen one. The chosen one. Or like um Kafir to say a beloved. Um just a set apart one. Um it, people go back to the Yaqi being the firstborn. Technically that is the firstborn, but it's not the firstborn by blood. I mean it's not the firstborn in order. It's the firstborn of Yahuwah. Yeah. The, the son who's a cod with the father. Exactly, the son of his father. We just talked about that, right? So when you look at this. It says, he says, the Yaqid and families. So he'll take this chosen person and set him in a specific family. The house of Yahoo, right? He says, he bringeth out those that are born with chains, but the rebellious uh, dwell in a dry land. So this, that whole process, Yahuwah judging the cause of the widow. He's a father of the fatherless. Now he takes the fatherless and set him, the Yaqid, in a family. That family is the family of Yaqids. They like the, it's a whole family of Yaqid, right? So we talked about um, that scripture where it talks about the sons and daughters of the Lord or the, um, or the house of Yahoo. That's the place that he's bringing you from. But you first have to mortify those members of that past life. Everybody got me? If that's, this is what he's seeking to do. This is what he will do. This is the future. This is the ordering of houses. This is the redemption. This is the salvation. This is the manifestation of the kingdom. But it all starts with a Ab and an Ema. Go ahead. So in verse 6 there, it said that he, he takes the Yaqid, he settles the Yaqid in the home, and he leads out the prisoners to prosperity. He leads a host of captives free. So this is what it's talking about in, um, was it Ephesians 4, where he says that... Um, he who has ascended is he who has first descended. And um, it says that when he ascended, he, uh, he descended to the depths of Sheol, leading a host of captives, speaking right. of Yahushua. So now, Yahushua said, I send you as the Father sent me. So then Yahushua becomes the Father that is now sending you to duplicate his work. So you as a Yaqid, as being one with the Father... You duplicate his work by now. You sent, lead a host of captive free. I've been reading um, Psalm 51, and something that's sticking out to me lately, to uh, teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will repent. And it, that, that line had been sticking out to me as, like, that's our purpose. Right. Those who can have the testimony, that the same testimony that Daoud talks about in his... Um, being able to have that relationship with Yahushua to be able to, to uh, say, you know, my lips will send forth your praises, all that stuff. Those people are these Yaqi right. yeah. that he is set in these different places. And your only purpose is to set a captive free, to send them to prosperity. Yeah. So that, just, just real quickly, that same thing was what was said earlier. That's what was so beautiful about the seeing the restoration of the nation. It was Isaiah 61. That's the same thing that's coupled with those two scriptures that Mor Yahusha and Mor Yosa was talking about. Um, the Yaqi, the Ruach of Yahuwah is upon him to bring good news to the meek. Um, he sent him to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim release to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Um, and then when you go down a little further, it says, and they shall 
rebuild the old ruins, raise up the former waste, and they shall restore the ruined cities and the waste of many generations. What has been laid waste for our people the most, family? That's how they got us. They infiltrated and broke up the family dynamic. So when you see something today, you see something like today, the restoration of families and households, that's Zion. That's building up the waste places, the old ruined cities. That's how you bring back the city on the hill. And that's what Yahuwah was saying earlier when he was having this being read. This is it. This is the restoration of a nation. When you see elders and Amaz brought up and being honored, that's the restoration of a nation. That is building up the old ruins, raising up the former waste, restoring the ruined cities and the waste of many generations. But it's done by a Yaqid being set in a house and setting a house in order, one who is one with the father. And then he becomes a father to the house. So <clears throat> this house we talk about, this we talk about the assembly of the firstborn. That the firstborn is the Yaqid. Right? That's the same terminology. So you, when, he, when it says that Yahuwah um, judges the uh, widows, he saves the fatherless, then he takes the Yaqid and sets him in a family and then leads them to proster prosperity. That's the assembly of the firstborn. Hebrews 12. To the general as assembly and feast days of the firstborn, the Yaqid, which are written in the Shamaim. Right? To a Lord, a judge of all, and to the rocks of just men made perfect. Right? Right above that, it says, But you come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living the Lord, the Sh and the Shammai in Jerusalem, to a innumerable company of Malachim. Right? So this is where we're at. This is what Yahuwah is trying to call us to. So we, now we have to set that order. So you about to say something before I wrap this? Anybody else about to say something? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So from who establishes the end from the beginning. So when we started the message, um, I can't even remember verbatim um, how Chief uh, put it, but he spoke about um, um, rejection as being like one of those continuous things that we fight. And this is what prevents you from getting everything else that he just talked about. That adoption, that being in the house, that not being a stranger just in the house, but actually being engrafted into that bloodline. And so um, something that two years ago um, Ma had given me and has constantly uh, ministered to me since then was um, she specifically while we were praying together, she said, um, because I, I'm very much a person who um, was under the belief that and I had to work for love. Right. And so it comes from rejection. So I think if I'm not functioning, if I'm not doing this, this, and this, then they no longer love me. And so because of that, um, what he, what I, what I was speaking to of him saying about when he started with rejection, it was something about um, the continuity of it. Like that's something that we constantly have to fight. And so um, the way that I fought it was was after um, being in prayer with Ma. And she said she gave me the weapon of assurance, and then she said Yahuwah says meditate on Romans eight. And so for the last two years, I'm like meditation on that thing, and I'm, it's constantly going and getting revelation every time I read it, every time I'm in a situation where rejection is trying to overtake me. And so um, so specifically Romans 8, but then also um, John 1 is another one that um, I use in order to bring myself back um, when I'm being overtaken by that. And it's John 1, um, starting at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of Alua, to those believing in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the desire of flesh, nor of the desire of man, but of Alua. And this all ties back into what they were saying about um, when she was talking about a nation. The father gives the mother that staff of authority. It says to him, to all them, he gave the authority to, to become children. And so... What, what it comes down to, the way that you reject being grafted into these bloodlines is um, re self-rejection, self-sabotage, not believing in that word. And because I've made that my meditation over the last two years, anytime the, the enemy comes at me with rejection and thoughts of rejection, and th which e eventually lead to rebellion, I'm constantly fighting it because I trust in that word. 
So when he's shooting arrows at me, fiery arrows at me, I don't get sick of, bro of putting up my shield of Imuna, the weapon of assurance that she gave me. I don't get sick of, of raising up my hands. And so that even makes is manifested when I'm physically worn. No matter how tired I am, I'm going to throw my hands up. I'm going to lift that praise up. And so that, that's, that's the way that we reject our inheritance and our birthright and our ability to be grafted in is because we get weary in fighting. Rejection is not going to stop coming. The enemy is not going to get sick of throwing arrows at you. But then we get sick of bringing up our shield of imuna, And that's when we get snared. And now we're just in the house as a stranger. And so as we go into, as he wraps it, and as we go into um, the homework and things like that, and I, I, I encourage everybody to replay this and really make it your meditation because Yahuwah is trying to minister to you. He's trying to extend that mercy to you for you not to be a stranger in the house. So and what Shah talking about is rejection is going to overtake you um, if you don't know how to submit yourself to Yahuwah. Because the, the way that you get approved by the elders is submitting yourself to Yahuwah and Yahushua. That's it. And anybody you bake, uh, baking, um, you know, baking cookies and, you know, building bird houses and delivering pieces, like that's not, you know, you understand what I'm saying? It's not like you're not going to. It's not favors that cause you to to get that um, favor. It's not favor that brings. It's not like you doing favors brings blessing, right? What brings blessing is your heart and your commitment. Because what it is is when people what. When there's a Torah, again, we're talking about the, the, the father's commandment, the mother's Torah. So you're always going to have um, a, a chief stand up, and he's going to give a certain commandment. He has the power to do what? Loose and do what? Whatever he binds or looses. So he's not, um, he's not doing it based on what you do for him. He's doing it based on what you have done for your whore. That's why Hasatan would turn some, why Shaul would turn somebody over to Hasatan. Shaul wasn't even there, but he judged it, right? He wasn't dealing with a person. The man ain't saying, this is a child. He ain't saying no money. All he says is like, okay, this is the situation. Right now, this kind of iniquity is going in. So now I'm about to judge this thing. I'm about to bind and loose it. I'm about to cut him off from the family. Because why? He's not serving Yahushua. He's not, his intents, his, um, his fruits are not bearing fruit. So going back, I just want to make this clear. It's not about, you know, kissing up or none of that kind of stuff. It's about, because this is the thing about it. A son, let's just think about a, a, a in a band, a father and a son, right? The father is not going to necessarily just do something for a child because they kiss up. Because if a real father be like, man, this dude right here, he always, because he knows he has an ulterior motive. Right. He's going to do this because he want to get that. He wanna he he wanna he acting right right now because he wanna go, go and get this. But you know who the father gonna bless though? That child is always obedient. That's his son. He's gonna be like, man, this this child, um, I told him to do this, not doing this because he's trying to get something in return. He's doing this because he lo he loves um me. Or he, he sees the things I'm doing and he know he there are there's an approval of my walk with Yahuwah, he sees that and he imitates it. He sees the works that I do and he try to imitate it. He, he's um, seeking after Yahuwah in the way that I am. So because of that, now I got to bless my son. This is the reason why, um, um, through the text, why it was such, we talked about this earlier, why it was such a huge deal for you to get the blessing from the Father, we know it, well, it will continue, right? So anyway, so say this to say this. So one of, part of your homework is going to be um, what are you doing to be approved by the elders or the, you know, the, say the Zakane? Or you can say council, it's the same thing. Scripture says, um, study to show yourself approved. What are you doing to be approved? Also, what things have you done or doing to cause disapproval? Yeah, and again, what are you doing to be approved? What things are you doing 
that will cause disapproval. Right? Scripture says if you do well, you will no doubt. Right. Because there's no it's not it's not ain't no money transactions or no land transactions or no physical items that's gonna cause that blessing. It's nothing there's nothing that Esau could have acquired to get his birthright back. Yes. The next question, why is the approval of the elders important? Come on, we're talking about a family. Now remember now, in our um, current tribe, there's an elder in each house, right? So you don't have to just ask these questions, you can apply them, right? Everybody has a chance to apply these questions that we're asking right now in their own um, houses. Because um, even the single women are covered within these houses. So. Um, the next question that you want to get, I want you to get find some scriptures on um, how do I receive, no, my bad, don't say receive, obtain. How do I obtain the favor of your whore? Find at least one scripture on it, like how do I obtain favor? Besides find a good wife. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the automatic, so. So what would it be a good wife, though? What is that? What is a good wife? Just real quick, what's a good wife? Committed to the chief. Say again? A woman that's submitted to the chief. A woman that's the sign of her father's house. Same thing you're saying. So, submitted to the chief. So, if a woman is not, this, if she's not bearing a fruit, and she's not the sign of her father's house, then she's not a good wife. Right? So, she might be cute. <laughs> but if she ain't bearing the sign of her father, then she is a bad wife. That means she's dysfunctional. Do you really think if a daughter is not going to obey her father, that she's going to submit herself to you? You're delusional if you think that's going to happen. And listen, whatever relationship she has with her father, she's going to require it of you. If her father is spoil her and buy her everything, give her everything, you better have three, four jobs. Because she's going to look at you because she's the sign of her. So she's going to look for something that's of her father in you. You better hope that her father is of you. Go ahead. So another question is, is there any fruit of a word that you've received from an elder? And, and when we're talking about elders, we're talking about a, an elder from the council. Is there fruit of a word that you've received from an elder or someone on the council? And then, is there a word that you know you have not received or that you've rejected? Is there a word that you've rejected from someone on the council, from one of your elders? So I'll give you another thing, too, I'm going back to this wife thing. So if she's not the sign of her father's house, then she might be a harlot. That's her father. So. Is, do you have any fruit of a word you have received from the council or, or an elder? And then the second question is, is there a word you've rejected from an elder?
So one more question you can add is, how has the word that I received from the elder multiplied? Because if it's an elder, your fruit supposed to do what? Multiply. Right? Seed after what? So on kind, remember the, Zy the what's the definition of Zycan? Right? That's the that's that's Psalms one. That's the tree that's planted by the water that um fruit never withers, leaves never wither, it's gonna continue to produce. So it should be if you if you allowed that word, if you in digested that word, that word should you should be able to build on it. It should have continual fruit. It shouldn't be like just situational, it should be something that can be applied to build the house. Um what I just say, run a bit somewhere. Right? From an elder, been multiplied. Seven, that's a good number. Where's your Question? Grandmother. So this is what's inter interesting about Yahuwah, because they were, you know, Saba, Saba goes back to war. It, like swords and stuff, but it also means grandfather. Because Yahuwah is a, I don't know if you know this, but Yahuwah is your, if you in this, if you're in the house of Yahoo, Yahuwah is your grandfather. Yahushua is your father. So it's Saba Yahuwah, the Ab Yahushua. So I mean, real, this is off the subject for today, but everything that Yahuwah does is about war. Everything. So. I just wanted to add to what Sha was saying earlier. Um, so over the week, I was listening to Chief Elder Moshe um, in the schizophrenia um, revelation. And he was saying that um, rejection, it's... First of all, it's just really important that if you're dealing with rejection, any form of rejection, that you fight that thing. Because he, what he said was that rejection is a tool that Hasatan uses. It's like he planted in us at such an early age, and he's like, okay, you might overcome everything else that you know has been thrown at you, but all I have to do is just flip that switch of rejection, and you like disavow your entire inheritance. Because now, like Shah said, you'll go back into... Um, rejection that will lead you to rebellion, that will lead you to just make yourself get out of the house. And so um, if y'all haven't watched more of Moshe's schizophrenia or revelation, please do it. Just fight against rejection so you don't disavow your whole inheritance. Yeah, um, Cain slew Abel because of rejection. Like, we are like, we don't, we don't see no other history of Cain up until that point. Like, doing crazy, wild stuff. It's just that he felt rejected. Then after that, he rose up and slew and killed his brother. That's how reject, rejection again. Rejection is the doorway for every unclean ruach. Right, every last one of them. So you start entertaining them thoughts of rejection, it's gonna lead you all the way out to Sheol. Right, and, re, and going back to this, like because it go back to what Yahuwah told Cain. He said, well, "If you if you don't if you had did well, right." So if you serve in Yahushua, just like what, what people talking about there, um, you're not going to be in torment. And then um, and you're doing what you're supposed to do. Because you know what you're doing. That's why you hear me say, a lot of time I talk to y'all like, yeah, you know what it is. I just say, you know what it is. You know, I've had multiple conversations with people who have had them type of conversations. Because the gist of it is that that torment, you don't have torment, torment from being guiltless. Right? Because if you did well, you know. But when you don't, you know that what? Sin lies at the door. It's that sin that keeps coming because Hastan keeps accusing you of it because you know it's there. And then that thing just starts welling up in you until the point where you have to act on it because you feel embarrassed or shame. All that shame, embarrassment, all that stuff gonna come with rejection too. Got a whole bus load of Ruwaks. And they out and he the gatekeeper knocking on that door. Just let just open the door, then he just stand back and let all them jokes come in.
Okay, I just want to share a quote that I came across, which I thought was really relevant for today. It says, although love is kindness, meekness, and gentleness, it's also order, obedience, structure, and function. Abba does not operate in chaos. Let's get our houses in order. Although love is kindness, meekness, and gentleness, it's also order, obedience, structure, function. I'll read the top part again. Although love is kindness, meekness, and gentleness, it's also order, obedience, structure, function. And there's a, a second part. I'll wait for you to be ready for the second part. I'll read that one more time. Although love is kindness, meekness, and gentleness, it's also order, obedience, structure, and function. Abba does not operate in chaos. So the Father does not operate in chaos. Let's get our houses in order. Abba does not operate in chaos. Let's get our houses in order. I thought this was a really appropriate um, quote, I just came across it earlier this morning before I came to the assembly. So one more time. Although love is kindness, meekness, and gentleness, it's also order, obedience, structure, function. Abba does not operate in chaos. Let's get our houses in order. So, um, Yacouba, so hopefully next week we won't get into Sab Saba and Sabta. So we're trying, to, we're trying to roll out like a series of definitions at a time so we can meditate on them things. And then we'll come back. So we'll hit all, all the major family roles. We're going to concentrate on those. Yeah. Yeah. Praise you for that. Um, so let's, um, let's continue to build on that. Let's, um, let's. Make the best um, of the time we have with our families, right? We see that that's the assembly of the firstborn, the Yaquis playing in the house, right? So let's make the best of that. Um, but it, again, it is optional. Just like I say, it's not a guarantee that every stranger is going to be in the house. There's no guarantee of that. It's, but if you do well, You'll be accepted. Hallelujah. All right, so um, I got enough. Let's see what anybody else do. All right, with that being said, I'm Sister Shalom, right in the house. Shalom, by online. We talk to y'all later. Rebirth of a nation. Rebirth Hebrew of a nation. kingdom building.